Remember, I mean, I can't sit by each other. Oh, now we have she a question to ask. We don't even try with his <laughs> first name. Good morning and welcome back. One item of business. Um, Trustee Leo Montgomery has arrived, and we had acknowledged your existence before, but this is Trustee Montgomery, so I just want everybody to uh, take an opportunity during the day to meet our newest trustee. Um, Dr. Hyreman, welcome to Florida Gulf Coast University, or FGCU, as you will hear us affectionately refer to it over the next hour that we spend time with you. Um, committee, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Daniel Hyreman. Dr. Hyreman is the Provost and VP for Academic Affairs at the University of Texas of Permian Basin. Dr. Hyreman, we are pleased to have you um, spend some time with us today. Our schedule provides for 55 minutes of committee questions um, directed towards you. Then we're going to leave 15 minutes at the end so you can quiz us. So make good use of the 15 minutes. Um, committee members, I will um, indicate when we reach the 15 minute mark so everybody knows that um, time's up for questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to get us started. Dr. Hyreman, I want to know why Florida Gulf Coast University? And I want to know why at this point in your career. Appreciate that. And again, thank you so much for the hospitable welcome. It's, it really is a pleasure uh, to be invited here to Florida Gulf Coast University. I'm just thrilled about what I believe is going to be a great experience uh, for me uh, personally and, and professionally. Um, well, um, I was attracted, and I am attracted, to Florida Gulf Coast's uh, recently articulated strategic plan and vision. You know, I've had the very good fortune, a really unusual fortune in my career, to uh, work at uh, young universities, uh, UT Brownsville, both of them in Texas, UT Brownsville, which was about 20 years old when I got there, and also UT Permian Basin, which is uh, just over 40 years old. And, uh, and I found that uh, younger universities uh, provide a nimbleness and a responsiveness that really enables positive and impactful change. You know, at the time I was at Brownsville, we were really able to accomplish quite a bit, building synergies with the local community, new and innovative programs. And uh, I was drawn back to Texas for a lot of reasons, but, uh, but above all, it was the innovation uh, of UT Permian Basin, which is located, if you've ever been in West Texas, if you get into uh, an airplane and go west from Dallas, um, it is a, uh, the Permian Basin is about 20% larger than Georgia, but has about 400,000 people in it. So outside of Midland and Odessa, Odessa is, is the campus, um, uh, there, there's not much out there except for a whole bunch of oil and, and gas right below the surface, of course. So, so again, for me, um, being at a young university, a, um, an agile, University really provides opportunities because you know in higher education today, uh, universities and it sounds strange for people like us who, of course, support higher ed and academics. Universities today struggle to remain relevant. They struggle to remain relevant in today's world, and because oftentimes they're not responsive to uh, to uh, to industry, not responsive enough to the increasingly diversified student body. And uh, the universities that, that I've been at, again, um, in, in Texas, were, were very responsive to it. So again, as I look at the, the vision of um, Florida Gulf Coast, its articulated uh, pillars that I think I mentioned in, in my letter, it, it's just really, really exciting for me. And I, and I really, uh, as, as a person who is interested in the presidency, I want to be at a place that can really make some long-lasting and impactful uh, changes to better the community and, of course, to promote student success in, in the local economy. Thank you. Dr. Isren, I'm going to let you ask the first question if you're okay with that. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Everything we do here at Florida Gulf Coast University should be done in the context of an overall vision, in particular, articulated by the president. What experience have you had with articulating a vision and engaging others in its implementation? What might be your vision for Florida Gulf Coast University in, first, uh, in the first few years of your presidency? I appreciate that question. 
When I was dean at, of the College of Liberal Arts at UT uh, Brownsville, we developed a, a strategic plan, a collaborative process with the 130 full-time faculty, and we wrote a vision, which again was the product of, um, of everyone. So, so I do have experience articulating uh, with the, uh, the, um, the community a, a vision. Um, UT, uh, at UT uh, Permian Basin, just uh, a year and a half ago, just before our SACS 50 review, uh, we uh, modified our, our vision there. We added uh, things that we'd been doing quite well and things we had planned to do. For example, we added in our vision statement at UT Permian Basin uh, that we were going to be excellent in online and on-campus delivery. And of course, UT Permian Basin, um, we, we do offer a uh, number of programs online. So we added that to the vision. We also added our contribution to healthcare. And while I was, while I was provost, we established a college of nursing to, to really uh, to, to benefit in, uh, the health of, of that part of Western Texas. So, so I have considerable um, uh, experience actually articulating vision and, and pursuing vision. As it relates to Florida Gulf Coast, again, you know, the vision of Florida Gulf Coast is, is very appealing. The first thing that, that I would do that I think is imperative for whoever becomes president of this university is to establish a culture of trust and communication um, with the community and uh, to make himself or herself known to the community. In that way, credibility of that person will be established and credibility for the articulated vision. You know, I'm, I'm really, like I said, excited about the, the pillars of academic excellence that have been articulated, the, uh, the pillar of health sciences. Again, these are things uh, near and dear to my heart as well. Entrepreneurism, which has been very important uh, so far in my career and at the universities I've been at and emerging preeminence. Uh, the task is at this point that you've got the strategic plan, you've got the vision, but to then sort of drill down and then to determine collectively and with input what will be those strategic directions to accomplish those pillars. You know, take for example, in the area of student success, there is a myriad of things one can do to improve six-year graduation rates. I know that I, I looked at the annual report and I noticed that the six-year graduation rate had faltered a bit at Florida Gulf Coast. And, and we have a similar uh, six-year rate at UTPB and a four-year rate. And it's, we're, we're not content with that. But you, ultimately, you have to decide, you know, what are you going to do? Now, at Permian Basin, what we did, we invested in something called the Student Success Collaborative from the Education Advisory Board which provides our advisors with predictive analytics about their advisees, about students, so that we know which courses students, given their aptitude, may have trouble with. So we know which courses give students in general trouble. So we understand um, what, which of our um, um, interventions uh, are more successful than others. So we can take action based upon those metrics. That was a huge investment for Permian Basin hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for that platform. And we had to get the buy-in of the faculty, because after all, this, this could not just be a decision of the provost and the president to, or, and the dean of student success to invest in this product. We had to engage the faculty who at Permian Basin advise our majors. I think you have professional advisors in, in the colleges here. We do too for the first two years. But ultimately, for that thing to work, for students to be engaged, for, for the success collaborative and our financial investment to, to, to pay off, we had to engage the faculty through, again, collaboration and, and essentially getting their assent to participate. So, and also in terms of the academic excellence, you have to determine which programs are you going to pursue in the area of health sciences. The one great thing, one of the many great things about Southwest Florida, you have a significant health industry here, biotech industry, in which you can collaborate. And I know one of the areas of, of interest that I would have is developing more graduate programs. Again, going back to your metrics in the report that I saw, I noticed that your graduate enrollment 
is, is a bit, uh, well, it, it's about where it is or maybe a bit lower. So I think there are probably are some things you can do in the area of academic excellence vis-a-vis -vis graduate studies, in particular in those areas that make sense for the regional economy here. Because after all, this, ser this university, like mine, serves the region. It is the economic, an important economic engine for the region. So I think those, those are some of the decisions. So just because one has a strategic plan and a vision, in many ways, that's kind of the easy part. The important part of a strategic plan is the process of the collaboration in developing it. The tough part is establishing strategic directions, articulating benchmarks so that the progress can be evaluated. Strategic plans are no good if they're just going to be put on a shelf, never to be brought out again. And really, until recently, that's what they've been in, in, in a lot of cases. SACS requires to have a strategic plan, for example, and it, for it to be updated. But it really needs to guide the institution. It is the cement that holds together administration and faculty. It is the direction, it is the discipline that universities need to move forward. I'll just I have a follow-up follow -up question. Dr. Isern. Um, so you mentioned that one of the first things that you would do is to establish a culture of trust. How would you go about doing that? And also, how would you en engage faculty in the process? Sure. Um, most simply, listen. Um, the, the one uh, thing that I found is I'm able to, and I think people are in general, uh, enhance their credibility by, by listening, by truly listening, not just waiting to talk or to, to say what you want to say, but, but by listening, by, by being um, uh, transparent, and, and of course, by showing that one's words are followed by one's actions. And uh, so having honest, engaged dialogues with uh, the Faculty Senate, and, and I've been really fortunate in my career to work collaboratively, collaboratively with, with, the, with the Senate, uh, with the Senates at, 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 at all the places I've been. And, and it's because it starts off with mutual respect. And also my belief, and this very well may get into another question I may be asked, you know, my fundamental belief that universities can only advance effectively if they, only if they harness the energy and the talent of the entire university community. And as president, my job is to create an atmosphere of free communication, of respectful collegiality that promotes communication and trust, and, and, and also uh, the, the welcoming of all and diverse ideas. Thank you. She doesn't need, she said she's good. Mr. Morton, could I call on you for a question? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody jumped out, so I thought, Mr. Uh, Mr. Morton, I, I, I'll let everybody, I'll let him know who they are. Mr. Morton is a uh, representative from our Board of Governors, which oversees the SUS system, and Dr. Isran is a faculty member um, in the Arts and Sciences College. Uh, good morning. Good Welcome. morning, sir. How are you? Uh, I read your, um, your preamble here, responses, which I found uh, very on point, very interesting. Could you articulate for our group here, uh, Strategic planning, I'm going to read you the question so that we're consistent in how we ask the question, but it, it pertains to strategic planning, which you address pretty ably in, in your uh, material. Uh, the next president will join FGCU as it has finalized the new strategic plan with an opportunity to shape and operationalize the approved strategic plan. Can you describe your experience with either leading a strategic plan, implementing a plan, or using the plan as a decision-making tool. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, when I was dean of the College of Liberal Arts in South Texas, we created a strategic plan for the college, which again uh, was the product of, uh, it was, it was a, an entire semester of meetings with faculty to determine um, the environment and, and uh, the, 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 the directions that we could realistically go. And so we produced that. And again, we not only, it wasn't just a wish list of where we wanted to go, 
but really based on an accurate assessment of where we could go, uh, given where we were, given our funding, and, and given, frankly, the faculty uh, the talent that we had at, at the time. And again, we established, and, and this is where it, it gets more difficult, uh, the strategic directions, uh, how we were going to achieve uh, our, our basic goals, and then determined the metrics that would determine whether or not we succeeded or not. You know, the metrics of uh, UT, UT Brownsville at the time, in, in terms of scholarly activity, would be different than, say, Stanford's uh, scholarly metric. Uh, but, but yet we, would, we established metrics so that we could, when we reviewed it again, uh, we could have an idea of if, in fact, we were making progress, what was working and what wasn't working. As I mentioned at UT Permian Basin, I, I got there and we were in the middle of our strategic plan. It, it was, it's a 10-year plan from 2009 to 19. Oh, and by the way, I am very happy to see that Florida Gulf Coast strategic plan is a five-year strategic plan because that is entirely much more realistic given the fluidity of the higher education landscape, well, just the landscape in, in, in general. So, uh, and we've accomplished uh, at Permian Basin pretty much all of our objectives there. You know, we've established a, a health presence in West Texas. We established uh, multiple uh, innovative programs um, in, um, in, in many different fields, uh, masters and undergraduate fields as well. We also are pursuing currently the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board strategic plan. And I mentioned in my letter um, one of the points to that, and of course the coordinating board is interested as we all are, but maybe even more pointedly in student success. And one of the items you may recall I mentioned in my, um, I mentioned in my letter were the marketable skills, which you know as an old history professor, as I I guess I still am, because uh, I do teach. Um, I remember sitting around a table when I was a professor in Al Alabama and uh, at uh, orientation day when uh, nervous parents were with their kids while I had Saving Private Ryan in the back, uh, trying to get all these students to sign up and be history majors. And nervous parents always ask me, well, okay, uh, my daughter wants to be a history major. She doesn't want to teach, so what in the world is she going to do? Well, of course. That was my entree to talk about. I didn't call them marketable skills at the time, but that's in fact uh, where, where, where I led the conversation. But in, uh, according to the coordinating board, one of the requirements is for each program uh, at the schools in Texas to articulate clearly what are those transferable or marketable skills that students will get from, say, a history major. We all know what they are, but what we've not done and what universities have not done well is really be clear about the real skills, the real values they offer. Because everyone in higher education just assumes, oh, people know about that. But as we all know, and Floridians are no exception, you know, we live in a world of, uh, of cynicism sometimes about higher education. There are, uh, I don't think, to unrealistic demands imposed uh, on higher ed to uh, be accountable. So each program then will articulate clearly so students know I'm going to learn critical thinking. I'm going to learn communication skills. So it'll be articulated maybe even on the syllabus and so that faculty will engage in conversations with them so that a student then will know that they do have something to bring to the world of business if that's in fact where they're going to go. Um, and so that they can, I think I used, be the entrepreneurs of their own success. So they can market themselves to prospective employees. Because I know all my friends who are history majors, they, um, they got jobs, oftentimes in business, because they did have those skills. So, um, so the coordinating board. The other thing is the, the chancellor, uh, the UT system, Admiral William McRaven, has articulated quantum leaps for the system. And uh, we are responding to that uh, de facto strategic plan. And, and one of the quantum leaps, um, of course, is student success. And I'll, I've said a lot about that, and I probably will say more perhaps later, is national security. And our response to that at Permian Basin is cybersecurity. So we are developing, in fact, I just got the, the embryo of it, uh, the uh, a certificate program of, in cybersecurity. So we are going to broach out into that because we have a very strong computer science master's degree program already. So again, in response to the strategic plans 
from our own plan, from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, which oversees all of the colleges and universities in Texas, um, and of course the UT system uh, in the person of the chancellor, we respond um, to, uh, to these things. But again, it is, uh, we can respond in many different ways, and that's the key. The key is determining how, which direction, because academic excellence or national security, there are a lot of things that you can do. So what you do is you look at what you can do, what you can do well, where there is a market for, where there is a niche for that. And in the case of our cybersecurity certificate, this certificate will, of course, not only is it needed because of the issues and I think the recent election, I think, has something uh, is illustrative of some of the issues and or lack of security. But, uh, but this certificate is aligned with best practice in, in business, so that if somebody graduates or gets the certificate in this program, they will be positioned to take the certification, the certification in cybersecurity uh, th that is recognized uh, nationally. So again, very much aligned with industry, because again, we want students to get a job and to be successful, not just get through our program and walk across the stage. Thank you. Dr. Allen, who is a faculty member in the College, the Luckert College of Business, would you be the next one to ask a question, please? Certainly. Dan, um, one of the things that faces FGCU is uh, how do we better establish our visibility in the competitive marketplace of higher education to, uh, units in the state and, and nationally and internationally? So what experiences, ideas, and skills do you have in establishing uh, university identity for FGCU? I appreciate that. You know, um, if I wasn't a history major, and, and I've only come to this realization in the last few years, and if I was going to be in business, it was going to be marketing. Um, maybe it was the math, uh, it was going to be the math obstacle that got in my way and I went to the marketing. But, um, but I, I currently serve um, on the uh, Marketing and Communication Committee. In fact, when I get back tomorrow, uh, we meet at 9 o'clock every Friday with the president and our marketing and communication specialists. Uh, and before that, at UT Brownsville, um, we really went through a whole branding process. Um, an integrative marketing uh, process at Brownsville. And I remember, it's funny, um, that when I was a dean there, I kind of was annoyed by that process because we had someone coming in telling us how our, uh, on our email, uh, what our email signature had to look like. And people really, I mean, even me, I said, well, come on, uh, th that's odd. But, but as, as it was imposed on us for uh, strategic reasons, I understood and I learned about the importance of branding, of, uh, of having guidelines for uh, presenting in the best light the university and the little thing like the tagline, all of them being consistent. I mean, that's a big deal given how many emails are sent out from, from the campus. But, uh, but anyway, I have a, really an unnatural, uh, I think, uh, enthusiasm for marketing at our university. In fact, I'm the guy who speaks up quite a bit uh, at UT Permian Basin, and I probably uh, annoy some people uh, because I do have a lot of ideas. One of the things we're doing is we're going to revamp our web page. Uh, all the web page must be great. If I was building a university, I would start with a web page before I hired a faculty member, uh, because that is the cheapest way to market the program. It needs to be student focused. And um, the new web page that we're looking at, the new uh, platform, the great thing I like about it has to do with recruiting. It's that uh, each program can, has a fillable form when a student fills in, hey, I'm interested in being a history major. I'm just going to pick on my own discipline here. That information uh, immediately gets entered in the CRM, the Customer Relations Management System. And then that person becomes part of the communication flow for recruitment. You know, currently, our, our web page, and I don't, I'm not sure what Florida Gulf Coast is, you know, it's pretty static. If you fill in a form, it probably gets printed somewhere, and, well, who knows what happens after that. Um, social media. Uh, I am the guy who, uh, and again, I've, I, who hired uh, the social media director and got us into uh, that space. Um, you know, social media, I don't know what you think of it, but this is the deal. This is where students are. 
This is where students are, this is where faculty, this is where grandparents are. We need to reach students. You know, the, the one thing that is most interesting, because I'm not a technical guy, was the development of our FalConnect app, our mobile application that I conceived and is now licensed and now being developed. It is, it is an application for the phone and all it does, all it does is it is a, an app that directs students to the people in the offices that, make them, that can make them successful. Financial aid office, counseling office, it, to the, the Canvas, we also have Canvas learning management system. But it is an attempt for us to insinuate ourselves into the social media lives of our students by going where they are. It's not pandering, because again, what we want is them to use the app. And we have some interesting features on that app, like, um, like an interactive map, if they um, will point at a building, for example, uh, say they want to know where the provost office is, which <laughs> they do if they have a problem, probably. Uh, they would point at my building, and there would be a little sign, you know, Heimerman's there, the provost. Provost office is there. Um, so this is currently being developed for, for, our, for our students. Um, a new athletic logo. You know, I was happy, to, I, was, I was of course like everyone enthralled with the success of Florida Gulf Coast and, and the NCAA. Of course, I'm a Wisconsin and Marquette fan, but, uh, but, uh, but I was very happy to see Gulf Coast in it as well. Um, but uh, we developed a new athletic logo. We just launched football, which, I mean, who does that? Texas does it, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and we, we launched a new football, uh, a logo for our team, which I was very much involved in, in that process as well. The other thing that's important, and really the most fundamental thing, you know, my job is academics. I mean, I am the chief academic officer. The way to en enhance the identity, the presence of the university is to have quality academic programs, accredited programs, and you tout that. That is what student wants. Programs that lead to jobs, making those connections. That's what students, that's what parents, that's what legislators want. Um, one of the things that I've also been working on, I don't know if you've ever seen Friday Night Lights. Maybe that, if you did, uh, you get a sense it's more, I'm not going to say it's true or not, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> the point is this, you know, there's a rivalry. It's not as great as that. I live in Midland, and uh, of course, Odessa is where the, the university is, and my wife and I, we go back and forth. Um, uh, and uh, well, anyway, um, one of the things that I've been working on is, is sort of bringing Midland, which is a, uh, a city of well, about 120,000 folks. Uh, you know, there are some fabulously uh, important people who, who live in Midland. Uh, the Bushes uh, used to live in, in Midland as well. But to, to better integrate Midland into Odessa, to, to market toward, toward Midland, and even though it's 15 miles away only, there's true, there is true somewhat of a rivalry. So and the current president has done a lot to really integrate it. In fact, we, we built a, a new campus, uh, the Midland campus. We have a fabulous arts center there and are, are going to lay groundwork for a new engineering building there as well. So, so integrating uh, Midland is something that we've been do, doing as well. But, uh, but yeah, these are some of the things. Signage, um, I believe it or not, uh, it, it, have had a role in signage around campus. I know um, uh, that can always be improved at universities. I think that the one thing that Florida Gulf Coast and other universities need to make sure they do is really plant your flag. I mean, this is a beautiful campus. People should know when they are on campus grounds. I asked uh, the guy who drove me here, I said, are we, I assumed we were, but, but if, if uh, you know, signage is really important, those little things are really important to really plant your flag, uh, whether it's here or in Naples uh, as well. So, so yeah, marketing is re really important, and obviously the president has uh, an <coughs> indispensable role in marketing. Whether it's fair or not, he or she is uh, the uh, embodiment of the university. And uh, they are the one who articulate the vision uh, publicly. They are the one who must make that vision resonate with the community. Just to follow up, have you looked at FGC's programs to see what you think are distinctive 
programs might be that would give us that higher visibility and establish a competitive position within the education market here? Well, I think the, the environmental programs you have are just an obvious, just an obvious uh, uh, place to go, given, given the, the location, given everyone's acknowledgement of how in this area the environment and sustainability are so important. I mean, you know, believe it or not, um, in West Texas, well, you know, there's a concern for the environment as well, even though that's not what you hear about as well. But I think the environment, you have some signature programs, you have some opportunities with uh, important industries, uh, again, in the biomedical field. Those are the ones that you can build synergies with industry. Again, it's been my experience. Again, we work in unapologetically. We do work with the oil and gas industry. We provide them with uh, engineers, geologists, business people. They've been generous partners with us in that. And um, so here, there's plenty of opportunities to partner with health. Uh, there, there's uh, logistics areas, of course, uh, um, Hertz and, and others. So it's really important to get, as we have done, endowed professorships from that way, internships, and above all, jobs for students. So I always would look to industry first to make these inroads. Because after all, this is the, this is the issue. It, it's about getting resources that prior, you know, oftentimes states gave more uh, money. And it's a careful balancing act with tuition. I know that 75% of your students are on financial aid. So, you know, raising tuition and just passing the burden to students, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that is the, that that's the right approach. So partnering with industry and providing industry with something in return that is trained professionals in, in the environmental science or in the medical area. <coughs> This, is, this will incline them to be a, a partner. Thank you. Dr. Isaacs, who is a faculty member in health professions, and I'm going to say it wrong. The chair of counseling. The chair of counseling, with a follow-up question. Or is this a new question? <coughs> new question. Um, fundamental responsibility of today's president is to run a very complex effectively in a very limited environment while meeting the metrics and goals. Uh, would you tell us about your experience with or your approach to building a team and infrastructure that would enable both you and the university to succeed? One of the first things I learned when I was a department chair, history department, and it was actually interdisciplinary, was that I don't know everything. I, I, I'm a trained French historian. I did not know anything too much about public administration. And, and, and so I knew early on that complex, even departments, but especially as you get into a college like the College of Liberal Arts at, at, uh, at, at Brownsville, which ranged from the humanities to forensic investigation, and of course now universities must rely on the collective wisdom, uh, must harness the collective wisdom of the faculty and staff. Yes. I'm a traditionalist, and that is the, that is the ideal of the academy. And, and that is a good reason to be uh, collaborative and to, to, to uh, allow for that kind of uh, uh, participation. But frankly, uh, I'm a pragmatist. And pragmatically, it is the only way that is to, uh, to, to run effectively a university, by relying on the collective experiences and wisdom of the talented people you hire. So in terms of managing, what I do is, first of all, I hire and appoint, and I'm happy to say I work with highly competent people. And I provide them with direction based on the vision, based on the strategic plan that we as a community have articulated and determined this is where we're going. And then I provide them with autonomy and support. I set the stage when I have meetings, and I have meetings, you know, that's what we sign up for as administrators, by having meetings that have an atmosphere of collegiality, respect, and open communication. I go into meetings, if I have an idea, and I go to the deans or I go to academic council, and I have an idea, I fully expect if, if somebody has a problem with my idea or if they find a, a gross error 
or just a tweak, they're going to, we're going to talk about it. And so I, I promote uh, collegiality, collegial, frank discussion. Because after all, the goal of everyone, and this is what I make clear, is to pursue the plan. It's not the president's agenda. It's not the provost's agenda. It's the university's agenda. So I establish, I like to believe, an atmosphere in which people can bring their A game to every meeting and they can speak freely uh, in a collegial way, be heard, and their ideas can, can be considered. Um, and, and, and you know, one of the things that uh, I, we, we work on at UT Permian Basin and I may be asked about data is um, to effectively manage a large institution, we need to know data, not just the provost, but we, pu I push, we push data down to program coordinators. They've got to know. Uh, they've got to understand the trajectory, the trends in their program so they can be empowered to make decisions. So decisions about <coughs> adding faculty or maybe not adding faculty can be made at their level. So um, collaboration, uh, open communication, and consultation, for me, it's the collegial way, it is the pragmatic, and it is the effective way, the only way to harness um, uh, the productive energies of people. Dr. Allen, follow-up question? I have a follow-up question. Um, we're talking about administrative experiences, and one of the things that caught my eye as a, as a strength that you bring to, the, bring to this table is um, your view that the academic calendar is not necessarily nine months long. And that it could be a year-round program, there could be year-round programs, there could be accelerated eight-week courses and semesters, mini-mesters, those kind of things. Um, that's not the way we've been doing things. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll, then I'll stop there. But, and it has something to do with their funding model and sure. things. But, but tell us how you managed to make that happen at your, at your university. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, um, sometimes you get in trouble when you ask why things are the way they are. Well, um, well, you know, of course, the, uh, the academic, traditional academic calendar, if I can just invoke history here for a minute, uh, is based on the old agrarian system in which people had to work uh, in, in the summer. And of course, that is the model I knew as a student. I, did, I never took a course in an intercession. I never took an accelerated course. Actually, I did, and I, I withdrew from it. Uh, and uh, I never took a summer course. <laughs> but this is the thing. Student, the composition of the student body has changed. It, to the chagrin of legislators and provosts, students don't, can't always take 15 hours a semester in the traditional semester. Life does not permit them to do that. I did that. I mean, I, I didn't have a family when I went to college. I did not even work except in the summer. I was very traditional. But many students are burdened with uh, a lot of responsibility uh, that, I mean, most students are non-traditional. In fact, someday we're gonna call, our, we're gonna call traditional students non-traditional. So we, uh, we, we, we were able to uh, extend the calendar. We did, I did this in Mississippi uh, throughout the, the summer, throughout the summer. At UT Permian Basin, in the summer, we have multiple start dates. We start new students every eight weeks. We have a carousel in which students can get into a program after eight weeks, get in, get in, get in, get in, get in. It is, it is a carousel in, in because we have sessions that run eight weeks, accelerated sessions. And, and uh, you know, people, how can you do that? Well, summer courses have always been eight weeks, so we just, we just do that. So it is about access. You know, the one thing that, you know, I, I, what appeals me about Florida Gulf Coast is, again, it's very similar to the experiences I've had, is that it does cater to first-generation students. It caters to a lot of students who no doubt work, a lot of students who no doubt um, are, have financial challenges. Um, and as, as a result, the flexibility of the schedule gets them through um, maybe not as fast as we'd like. It's, it's quite true, but it certainly allows them time to remain active. You know, if we would just have, and, and, and this is something to talk about, uh, just to fall and spring, I'm worried about what happens in the summer, 
about students not coming back, especially non-traditional students. So by having a carousel, we keep them engaged. They are on the carousel. It is much more difficult to get off because there's something always starting. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that has really been an important uh, part of my career at the last few places. Um, and it's all about access. It is about educational access um, for students. And to the credit of the faculty at the places I've been, they've responded. Now, at first, yeah, people wonder, how can you do it? You know, it's, 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 this is different. But to the credit of the faculty, they have responded, and, and many, of, many of the faculty really, really enjoy the eight-week session. But stretching the calendar, it's also more economical uh, use of the resources. Hang on. I just want to remind everybody, we're being told that this isn't to you, Dr. Hyreman, this is to the committee. If you're not about to eat the microphone, you are not close enough for anybody to hear you. So um, if you get close enough that you think you're about to consume it, you're perfect. Okay. okay. That's the only way I can describe it. I've made the point, but we're being told they can't hear us. Um, is this a new question or a follow-up? Follow-up question. Follow-up by Dr. Allen. Um, I have a train of thoughts broken now, but how, how important, that. that's okay. <laughs> it doesn't take much to break my train of thought. <laughs> how important would creating that carousel mechanism be for you in, in terms of the priorities of things that you might think that we need? And I'll, I'll say that uh, because of our economy and our population being very seasonal, a lot of the our working students' best opportunities to make money are in, during our tourist season of January and February. Uh, so summertime is when our students are free. Uh, so right. that's when they should want to take classes, but we're funded on the nine-month model, that agrarian model. So, so just how, sure. with that in mind, how, how high is the priority of this well, for you? I think it'd be a mistake for me or, or any incoming person to just because they've had an experience somewhere else that worked that it's going to necessarily work um, uh, where it may not. So, you know, the first thing that would have to be done is to, to look at it. Is there a demand? Is there a demand for this kind of, of scheduling system? There may not be. There may not be. But the bottom line is, are students being served? Th that's based, it's as simple, it's as, simple as that. And, and, and again, to, to the credit of the faculty I worked with, they have, um, well, their summers were intruded upon. You know, many faculty really enjoy summer off to do research, travel with family. And, uh, but because at least where I was, I'm from and where I've been, there was a need for it. Um, it was done. But, but no, th th this would certainly have to be something that would be looked at. Is there a market for, for this? I is it necessary? And maybe in some programs it is. Maybe in some it's not. We, we don't have eight-week carousels in every program. Some faculty, frankly, um, uh, um, they, they uh, philosophically have a problem with it, and we don't force that on them. Um, so so it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Thank you. Mr. Call, not to put you on the spot, but um, Mr. David Call is the uh, chairman of our uh, foundation at the university, and I'm hoping that he might ask a question about foundation type items. I marked it. I kind of figured that would be Thank you. asked to, as I eat the microphone. Thank you. Uh, we recognize the need to generate additional resources beyond our current funding level to support our mission and move to the next stage in our uh, evolution. What is your experience in generating external resources and the success you've had, and specifically, what was your role in the resource development? First of all, any time I begin talking about external resources or I'm trying to cultivate um, a donor, um, I always have to begin by assuring the potential uh, donor that the university is doing all it can to conserve resources, that it's doing all it can to, on its own, generate resources. Uh, so, um, and, and that means, you know, making sure programs are being offered that students want to take, making sure that, um, that, that we are doing all we can to uh, increase enrollment and, and so forth. But, um, so, so I always begin that because it's really important, as you know, I'm sure, sir, that when we talk uh, about development, uh, it speaks to the credibility of the institution and the credibility of uh, the vision and, of course, the, uh, the, the president 
and the person who is, in fact, asking uh, uh, for a donation. Um, as far as external resources, <coughs> I have had uh, really good success in my career uh, with um, promoting grantsmanship, first of all. Um, I, I think I, I recorded in, in, my, uh, in my letter that when I went to the College of Liberal Arts, we, they just ha got $18,000 a year in external funding, and we bumped that up to one and a half million. And it was through the hard work of the faculty who wrote the grants, but my role in that was to simply make grant writing a priority and follow it up with a system of rewards and, and, and to, to validate it through whether it's uh, promotion or tenure or uh, merit increases or maybe it was release from other kinds of duties. So making it important and, and also connecting it to the vision and the plan that we articulated while I was there. Now in terms of private gifts and corporate gifts, and, and in fact, uh, that's the thing that, that I've been involved in just recently. Again, in the Permian Basin, we are very fortunate to have not only some fabulously wealthy industries in the area. In fact, uh, just on Tuesday, I was talking with a gentleman from, you can imagine, the kind of industry that was a $17 billion uh, corporation uh, trying to cultivate uh, internships or a relationship, which is where it starts, uh, a relationship. So um, we've had success there. Endowments, professorships, you know, these are things that we've had much success in getting for petroleum engineering, endowed professorships, even, believe it or not, endowed professorships in the humanities. Uh, so, so we've had considerable success uh, getting, getting these funded as well. And of course, scholarships as well. Now, it is true that the president um, of UT Permian Basin, he rightly takes the lead in, 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 in talking with you know, the big name donors. You know, my role, my role is support role. My role has been to, uh, to get with uh, academic people, for example. We had a, uh, a physician in the area who we learned was interested in making a substantial donation, and it enabled us to buy a, an electron uh, microscope, which was $225,000, and he established an endowment in neurobiology. So again, um, my job is a convener of people uh, with the president, with academic people, because sometimes they're better positioned. In the case of the physician, he wanted to talk to my dean, who happens to be a biologist, and they could speak more about electron microscopes with greater authority than I could. We also have had great success in software acquisition beyond money. You know, software acquisition in particular, not surprisingly, having to do with well activity, oil well activity, worth millions of dollars that our students use and become proficient in, and then ultimately go work for those companies as well. Um, so in, in terms of development, working with the president, you know, we cultivate these friendships. And you know, the one thing that, uh, the, the question that I have, I know Florida Gulf Coast, and, and, and perhaps it's a disadvantage, you have, you're 20 years old and you have younger donors, but those are the people with whom friendships need to be cultivated. And probably the difficult thing for a president coming in, but something that I recognize is that the incoming president needs to engage with those alumni. And it's, and it's, it's a no-brainer, but you may think, well, why wouldn't they be interested in doing that? Because probably that is going to be a deferred investment. That is going to be, but you can engage them through volunteerism, getting them involved, keeping in touch with them liking you on Facebook, on your Facebook page, for example. Um, but that cultivation needs to happen. Again, this is why we, we began the social media, to friends, to, to, to get more friends. This is why, and again, I had a significant role in developing programs around homecoming. You know, we had, it was goofy, we didn't have football. So we developed football and had our first fall homecoming. That is all about development engaging the community, engaging stakeholders with the university, getting them um, more familiar with the mission, and above all, with the people 
of the university. You know, the role of the president is to be that voice of the university, that one who can articulate vision, the one who can bring to that vision credibility and life. And uh, so, so yes, the, I've had a role. The president must have a role in development, uh, working with development professionals in a coordinated way. Thank you. Um, is it a follow-up, Dr. Okay, but it needs to be very quick, like two minutes, Dr. Heimerman, if you don't mind. Dr. Isram. A quick follow-up. So you mentioned that um, resources are important as far as uh, grantsmanship and um, how, could you expand a little bit on how you would make grant writing a priority and how you would incentivize faculty to do so, especially if they have a full teaching load? Right. And, and, and that, that has been, that, that's been an issue every place I've been. Again, I have been at places that were largely teaching universities. Uh, UT Permian Basin, our teaching load is, well, it's 12 hours a semester, but we give a course release if somebody's engaged, so engaged in research, which is essentially everyone uh, who is a tenure track or tenured uh, person. So, so yes, that is the thing. First of all, as it relates to grantsmanship, this is the key. And this is where discipline and the vision and the strategic plan come in. You don't apply for every grant. Uh, you apply for grants that are appropriate to your mission, appropriate to the synergies and the talents and interests of the faculty. There are some grants you will not apply for. I remember I was at one place, they applied for a grant that got us 10 buses. I mean, we needed them, I guess. But I remember sitting in, them sitting in a garage and getting rusty and having to be repaired. That maybe wasn't a good, I don't know, maybe it was. I was just a professor then. But th the point is, so first of all, the institution has to make a decision which direction it's going. If it's biomedical. And if there is a grant, an, an NIH grant, that looks really appropriate for the skills of faculty, in my mind, the dean and the provost need to work with the faculty to reduce the workload so that the person has time to write the grant. And even if not funded, this is the thing I've always been, even if not funded, that's real work. That's real work the faculty has put in. Because the thing about grant writing is you recycle those things, they get better, and ultimately, hopefully, they hit. But, but it's very true that I know many faculty say, why apply for a grant? My chances, especially for a competitive one, are very minimal, not as, not as, uh, not as obvious, not as uh, possible as, say, writing a, a paper or something like that. I appreciate that. But we rewarded grant writing for the sake of grant writing. But it has to be disciplined. Perfect. I'm going to ask the last question. We have about 10 minutes left before we turn it over to Dr. Hireman to quiz us and pay back the favors we've given him. <laughs> Thank you. I, so my background is I have a PhD from Texas Tech. I went to West Texas <laughs> State University, all places you're, um, I do. you're familiar with, obviously, for a variety of reasons. Um, and those were regional colleges. In fact, I would say Tech is probably a super regional college in, in some, some capacity. And I think about the job here. Um, and I think it's one of the one, probably one of the premier jobs for uh, a school that's a regional university in the country. I say that because we're 20 years old, as you alluded to a minute ago, um, and we're on the cusp of really what are we going to be and breaking into that super regional potential. Um, we have some really developed programs that are right there. Um, funding is always an opportunity as you look at a school this age. You've hit that we have a young alumni. But as part of this, there will have to be transformation. And from my perspective alone, I'm looking for a trans transformational leader who's going to take us to that next level. So I would like you to tell us, what, what do you see as the opportunity and what, what are the transformational items you see that in your first two or three years here that you're going to make a huge impact and launch this school into its next piece of history? Well, again, as I said, I think at the outset, the first thing that must happen with the president, who, who, you know, whoever that person is, is to establish trusting relationships with the people in this room and certainly with the faculty and with the staff. I think the key to the transformation of a university in this day and age, um, and this is why I think it's so uh, appealing to be considered at a university that is so young and agile and vibrant as Florida Gulf Coast is that the university must make uh, connections with local industry. 
as I've said. I mean, I, I truly believe that in terms of funding, in terms of advancing, in terms of impact, local industry, uh, it must be engaged by the university. So for Southwest Florida, I mean, it's obvious. Uh, there is, of course, uh, tourism. Uh, there, there's, of course, uh, construction, which is still uh, important in, in this area. And there's emerging IT and, and biomedical. And, and again, the, so it's about serving the community and being able to capture resources from privately held industry. The state, as you know, uh, is probably not going to give percentage-wise more money. Now, you have to hit those marks, and strategically, I I've worked in Mississippi where we've devised strategies so we could do uh, the things that the state asked us to do in the formula. But to make impactful changes, to build buildings, for example, you have to align with industry. You know, at Permian Basin, we had just dramatic success this past year, getting a $52 million tuition revenue bond to put up our 90,000 square foot engineering building, which will be breaking ground this spring in our Midland campus, all aligned with industry. We got a grant from the Midland Development Corporation. The Midland Airport is, a, is one of the first recognized space ports. We began and we got from them uh, a grant to begin our aerospace engineering program, intimately connected with local economy. We are opening a kinesiology building, and it is an academic building, but it probably had something to do with uh, the advent of a football as well, because we're going to need that space. And again, heading back to the Friday Night Lights, it's a big deal in, in West Texas. Uh, it's very unusual for a Texas university our size not to have football, and it was just, and it was just a great, a wonderful year uh, for the university and, and for the community. So again, to, to, to make impact, there must be um, a partnership. There's a medical community here as well. And given the, the population, now you have a lot of younger people, in particular among the Hispanic, uh, the growing uh, Hispanic population here, which is another opportunity, I think, for Florida Gulf Coast. I know you're only maybe 18 or so percent Hispanic. I think there may be some opportunities there. But of course, there's an aged population as well. I think you do offer some continuing ed, I believe in Naples, maybe. Um, and uh, so I think there's some opportunities with, with, with medical care in, in that arena as well. But that is the only way that university like Florida Gulf Coast is going to make an impact by partnering with, with major industries that can provide the resources to hire high quality faculty and more of them to build the infrastructure that'll take Florida Gulf Coast to the next level. Any follow up to that question? We have a few minutes left. Yes, not. Um, well, it's come to that time. We have about, we do actually have about 15 minutes, okay. 16 minutes left. So I think I'll turn it over to you and you can ask us questions you may have um, for the committee um, about anything that's on your mind. Probably you should do them to me, then I'll figure out so a little <laughs> okay. bit of the Well, I'm going to start with you, uh, <laughs> yeah. Dr. Smith, because, uh, of course, I, you know, um, I appreciate the sunshine law in Florida. And, uh, you know, I was, I, I've kept up on the search, obviously, because... I have an interest, um, as you can tell. Um, and I read, I, I believe, uh, Dr. Smith, you, you mentioned, and I think this is true of others, that Florida Gulf Coast is looking for a different kind of president, a new direction. Maybe I was wrong. But, uh, and I'm wondering, and if I'm wrong about the new direction, I'm interested in what direction would you all like to see and what are the kind of qualities, and Dr. Smith, you mentioned at least one quality of the president you'd like to see in the next president at Florida Gulf Coast. So I, I did say that. I want to clarify because I, I, I find myself doing this quite frequently. That is not to insinuate that the current president, there's any, I mean, he has done a fine job. So I always start out with that because you could make the insinuation and that was not what I said, but that you were correct in what it was. I think that my point goes back to my last question is 
Um, we are 20 years, and we, we do need a, a direction. If you look at our performance uh, metrics at this point, uh, the big one I think you've hit, which is graduation rate, um, six. I don't like six-year graduation rate. I don't know why we use that metric, but I hear you guys in the academic community do. I like four-year graduation rate, and I think your point about um, different students um, than when we all went to college, potentially were a number of us around the table. I forget there are much younger people than myself um, around the table, but um, I can remember my father directly telling me I had four years to get out or the fun was going to be cut off, which was his pocketbook. Um, so, so I think that what we're looking for is, um, and, and you've said some things that are interesting to me, I, I believe analytics is something that, that we need here um, to better understand what our student population looks like. Um, and those kind of things. So I think that we need somebody to come in um, with a different perspective um, on how we're going to manage because um, Governor Morton is not going to let us have any more money if we do not, and his peers, I should say, not just him, but we, we've got to increase um, our graduation rates, but more importantly, our cost of degree. The longer you're here, the more it costs to get the degree. Um, we are the best institution or one of the top two for um, our students getting out and getting good paying jobs. And I think we're very proud of that. But we need to get them out quicker. We need to reduce the debt that they're taking on. We need to utilize taxpayer money better. And so those are the things, as we talk about a new direction for, for me, and I'll let others talk, I think we just need a new set, a fresh set of eyes. And it's probably bigger than just the president, potentially. But we need to look and say, how are we going to move forward given our funding base has changed dramatically and how are we going to optimize getting students in here um, and getting a majority of them out some students because of their situation can't do it they have families are returning whatever that is they've got to work full time um, but then how do we make a system here as you said with your carousel which i thought was very intriguing um, how do we make that work? So it's, it's, we're looking for that kind of a fresh set of eyes that can say, hey, this graduation rate is not going to work. And I think the current administration feels that way. So I don't want to say they don't. But what are we going to do different? And I think we just need some new different ideas. We need a risk taker. I'm going to take some calculated risk here to move the needle. Um, so that would be my comments. But I would open it up to anybody else have additional comments. Um, Mr. Morton. Again, good morning. Uh, my response will, will, will come from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, I, I'm a graduate of FGCU. She tortured me for a while. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm also the past vice chair of the board, the chairman of the foundation. And I currently sit on the board of governors and we have to ratify uh, this decision of the board of trustees. Uh, my perspective is, is this, could you give us, in response to Dr. Smith and some of the questions you've heard, the interest that we have as respects both our faculty and our students and they're the heart and soul of our university system. Uh, one of our real interests is how do we improve the graduation rate? How do we reduce excess credit hours? Do you have a specific idea or any ideas in mind that would that you could enlighten us as respects steps, concrete steps, not hypotheticals, mm -hmm. that you would take right. that would address just those two issues, graduation rate, by the way, in four years, not six. Right. And uh, secondly, how, how, how could we better address our students uh, through reduction of excess credit on ours? You know, the, um, the elusive question about, or the answer, rather, the question's easy. The elusive answer for four-year graduation rates is why don't students graduate in four years? Why, why don't they? Because I don't think we really know. Uh, we have ideas, but, you know, we're not really sure. As a result, there are, there's this scattergun approach to retention. I am a ardent believer in quality advising. Quality advising with data analytics that we are now armed with at UT Permian Basin, that our advisors now armed with data, they know their student aptitudes, they know their capabilities, they know their test scores, they know all of the success rates of every course at UT Permian Basin. 
They can counsel that student, hey, you're not good in math, maybe petroleum engineering is not your thing, and have tough discussions with them. And they can base it not on because they're looking at the person and what they look like. They can say, look, these are your test scores, these are your grades, and hey, look at these grades. The people who got C in calculus, none of them are 20% graduated. Um, those kind of discussions, because they're tough discussions in the Permian Basin when so many kids want to come and be petroleum engineers, God love them, they don't have the aptitude for it. It's not going to happen, or if it does happen, it's going to take 10 years. It's going to put them in debt. Um, so using uh, data analytics, rewarding great advising. You know, at, at UT uh, Permian Basin, as I mentioned, the first two years are professional advisors. The last two are faculty. And some of our faculty do a fantastic job advising. We haven't done, up till now, a good job training them in advising. And we certainly haven't rewarded them, and we haven't assessed advising. That is changing at Permian Basin. We are, uh, we are asking them to do more by providing them with data about student success and interventions. You know, the Falcon Act app that I developed is all about student success. It's all about bringing to students in the place they go, and I, I go too, and my 10-year-old daughter goes here as well, whether it's my phone or hers. That's the, the nexus. That's the meeting point to make the already existing and effective programs we have on student success more accessible, to meet them where they are. So, but the elusive question, and the thing about advising is this, and I'll end with this, is the, the elusive answer is we don't know why students, um, why there's attrition. Effective, engaged advisors and mentors, we got to rely on them to tell us. We got to rely on them to ask, hey, what's going on? And have a list of questions. You know, we have first generation students. They may not know which questions to ask their advisor. We need intrusive advising. And to ask them more than just about, hey, oh, you need a schedule? I'll release your hold and knock yourself out with your schedule. That goes on. Rather, let's review your, let's review your transcripts. Let's look at your progress. What else is going on in your life? Um, how much are you working? You know, what's your financial aid situation? Um, and, and other kind of issues. And then if, in fact, they do drop out, of course, we do all we can to bring them in. We find out what the reason is so that we can collect that data and really put together then some interventions to prevent that. But again, the problem is, is we really don't know. It is not just because students are ill-prepared. I mentioned the comment of math. It's true that is a problem. For engineering, they're not. But there are many other reasons. Oh, and by the way, there are some things we can't do things about. I, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a realist and a pragmatist. There are some things that intrude on people's lives, health issues that, unfortunately, um, we just can't do anything about. But there's a lot we probably can. And, uh, and again, in, in indebtedness, uh, the issues of you know, students having to pay bills and having to stop out, make those tough decisions. Do I go to college or do I pay for my flat tire? I mean, they have those kinds of decisions. Or do I pay the health care bill? So, but that, that's a great question. And, and this is your time to ask us, but Vice Chair Rebsdorf would like to ask, I Please. think, a, she, want, she has something she'd like to well, ask. Well, first of all, I think I need to give full disclosure to our legal counsel down there. I'm an alum of UNA, University of North Alabama, <laughs> so I was so shocked to see that you were a professor there. Well, after my time, though. But uh, to answer your question, it was, it was your question, we have done a lot, extremely, extremely well. Uh, when, but we lose sight of that sometimes because funding is different today. But we have been a very good comprehensive university and our output has been very good, being number one and two, and our students getting good paying jobs. But we're 20 years old now and we want to continue to be a good comprehensive university because when you look at our region, there's some diversity within our job market. And you can't, you can't force onto students today 
what they should like and what jobs they should want. They, they have their, their, their wants, and they'll excel when they do something they're happy with. But at the same time, being 20 years old as Governor Morton, we need our flagship. We need to find what we do extremely well so that throughout the country, when you think of this, you're going to think of Florida Gulf Coast University. Our Sweet 16 certainly put us on the map, <laughs> but it was the front door to all of the awesome, fully accredited academic programs that we do have here. So we want to keep the pressure on the pedal of being a good comprehensive, but we need to find that flagship. So I would like to see your cape on the table and that's what I want out of the next president, is somebody who can keep it going, but plus bring us to that next level of flagship. Can you do that? Right, I, again, I think with the community involvement, with the, the synergies that exist between the faculty and community, those things, yeah, can be fine. That is the only way, and, and you're right, I am a, a product of a comprehensive, Met my wife at North Alabama, by the way, who is an alum, uh, and um, and but but there are you can't be well you can be excellent in everything, but you've got to focus, and and, and 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 that is the tough thing, and there are opportunities. You know, I'm not going to say it, I'll just say it. Okay, the health field has more money uh, than the history profession. <laughs> so as much as I would love to see a PhD program in uh, southern history uh, at, you know Florida Gulf Coast uh, that'd be great from my point of view um, uh, there's probably more opportunity in something like biomedical just it's just the reality in which we live in it's maybe more appropriate given the industry that that's here so so yeah that is the challenge to remain a an excellent comprehensive and then to pursue selectively selective excellent programs and establish centers of excellence that will later engender other centers of excellence. Outstanding. One, we've got time for you to ask us one more question if you have one. Um. Sure. Um, so let me just ask you about, um, I think you mentioned this. So what is the relationship, uh, like town gown relationship? What do people, if you're in Fort Myers or you know, you're, you're, in a, you're in a local, um, town you know what is the relationship what do people say about florida gulf coast what do people know about it i know you talked about the issue of um, you know visibility and i think that is you know the local university sometimes gets maligned you know uh, sometimes or they don't know as much about it as you think they should so what do people say so Dr. Gregerson, who is the Dean of our Arts and Sciences College, uh, could you respond to that, please? Yeah, and uh, I'm answering it from the perspective as a relative newcomer. I've been here about two and a half years, and one of the things that really amazed me, and again, this goes back to the youth of the institution, you have the people still here who made this place possible. So I think there is a resounding pride in this area for what they built, what they helped enable. So I, I find the town gown relationship, if you want to call it that, to be uh, different than any I've ever seen. Because if you're at a 200 year old university, the people who made it possible aren't around anymore, or even a 50 year old university. So that's one component of it that I can speak to is that you, you continuously run into people and have conversations with people who were instrumental in, in bringing this university here and continue to be engaged. So I would say, at least from that perspective, it's, it's an amazing relationship. Can I ask one more question sure, of a student? Absolutely. Um, I'm interested in the students. Um, what, is this, what are the students, when they think of the president, what are they looking for? I was going to ask him to ask a question, but he wouldn't look at me. I didn't, and I didn't, I didn't want to catch him off guard. Didn't have a so I actually had Susan trying to text him to say, hey, look over here so I can get him to ask it. But I didn't want to catch him off guard, that's so I'm glad old, you did that's that. That's an old student trick, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. But to, to answer your question, uh, the, the biggest thing that uh, the students look for is someone that can take the direction given by 
the board of governors, the board of trustees, and infuse that with the current student culture and infuse it with the things that makes FGCU great. So focused on the diversity, focused on uh, the environmental uh, sustainability and all those key aspects of our campus culture that makes us who we are. That's a great Thank answer. You. answer. Thank you. Got, you can do one more. Um, okay, I, I, <laughs> I'm always prepared. So um, what, if any, um, budget concerns do you have regarding the legislature. I know you have, uh, and maybe I'll just we'll open it up a bit, you have a $100 million campaign, and it seems, man, $33 million already, right? Did I read that somewhere? We should be there. Okay. We'll be there by the end of the okay, year. Okay, I, re I read something like that, which is, which is outstanding, <laughs> and it's year. a rather ambitious and broad sort of uh, uh, campaign. So uh, financially, I mean, um, uh, what's the status, and maybe in terms of, the legislative outlook and giving? Uh, so I, I'll answer that because we're going to be short on time. So okay. I think from a legislative perspective, um, it's been made clear to us and we have embraced this um, that we will gain new money by two methods. One will be the performance-based funding metrics. Um, the other will be through, um, the, through philanthropic activities of the foundation or others. Um, that's not to say that if we had a one-off type um, project, that we might not get a special um, amount of money given to us to start a new program or something of that nature, but but increases in in funding are going to come by excellence in the performance-based funding. Um, and so, it, I mean, it, I can't make that clear enough. There is no pot of gold. Um, it's a statutory requirement now that we are funded through that mechanism. So. Um, so there, it's a, it's a, and that's why the question about performance-based funding and graduation rate is so important, and why you continue to hear that. And I think you rep recognize the importance of that. Um, the other thing that I think you may have picked up on is that um, the president of the university will be the face of the university, but also will have a huge um, job in raising money through the community businesses. You've hit all the things that one would expect. Um, so I don't think that there is a money issue. Um, as far as our funding base, but I do think that the reality is is that if we don't improve in the performance-based funding, we could see a loss of funding. So um, luckily, we have not been in the bottom three. Um, as a trustee, I, we should not ever fall in the bottom three. We have way too much going for us to allow that to happen, but that is that will be the funding. So physically, we're in a great shape. Mr. Call um, and his leadership, <laughs> I mean, we have a whole group of uh, Mr. Winton, Mr. Morton, and Mr. Ackert have all been uh, chairman um, of the foundation. So these are the gentlemen that really got it started. And then Mr. Call took over at a time when we started a hundred million or a hundred million dollar campaign. So um, I think we're in great shape, but w we have a lot of work to do. There is untold, ta untapped potential in this region um, for philanthropic activities, but also there is a a potentially good windfall on the upside of the performance-based funding. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that, that's the cold, hard reality. It's going to come from two, di two, two different pots, and it's going to take concerted effort, risk-taking, and those kind of things to move us forward and, and garner more funds. Sounds good and yeah. sounds familiar. <laughs> um, okay, with that, man, we're good. You, you, you did well on the questions. Um, well, we have enjoyed talking with you today, and uh, I want to thank you for um, coming all the way from Texas and uh, visiting with us today. And uh, I think on behalf of the committee, just thanks a lot for taking time out to come visit with us today. And I want to thank you. It's, it's a wonderful experience and just a tremendous uh, personal and professional opportunity for me. So, again, I appreciate your interest in my candidacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, before we all get up, um, we're going to take a uh, temporary recess for lunch. We will be back here at 1 o'clock to start again. So if we could be back in here about 12.50, that would be perfect.
Oh, it's 102. Let it go. We're trying to keep you away from the food. <laughs> welcome back, everybody. Let's recommence. Um, Dr. Jarley, welcome to Florida Gulf Coast University, or FGCU, as you will hear us affectionately call it today. Um, Board, uh, the committee, I'm proud to uh, and very pleased to introduce Dr. Paul Jarley. Dr. Pa Dr. Jarley is the Dean of the College of Business Administration at the University of Central Florida, one of our sister institutions in the State University System of Florida. Dr. Jarley, we're pleased to have this opportunity to spend some time with you. Our schedule provides for 55 minutes of committee questions of you, and we have saved 15 minutes at the end of the interview for you to question us or make comments about what we may have asked you. Um, I will let everybody know when we get close to the 15-minute uh, mark so that we can turn it over to Dr. Jarley. Um, Dr. Jarley, I'm going to ask the first question um, of you, and I'd like to know why Florida Gulf Coast University and why at this point in your career to be the president of our, of our great institution. Well, thank you, Ken. It's, it's great to be here with everyone today. Um, so um, FGCU is a young institution. It, it's um, going to be about 20 years old, um, which is uh, younger than my two daughters are. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, I think as a young institution um, like UCF, um, it um, aspires to kind of blaze its own trail in higher education. It um, has the advantage of not having maybe um, the institutional rigidity of a lot of other institutions. I find that really appealing. Um, I think it has a really strong sense of place. I walked the campus, right? spent about an hour. Um, the um, point about sustainability rings true on campus. It's very easy to see, it's very visible. I understand why it's a really strong part of you. I like the part about civic engagement as well. I think that also ties in, in nicely um, to place. And like I said in my letter, you know, all institutions, I think, over the next 20 to 50 years are going to struggle with what the unique value proposition is. Um, no institution, including UCF, can be everything to everybody. And so the most important conversation to have is what you are and what you are not. Okay? And, and the more definite you can be about that, the more it helps you focus in on the things that are actually going to really differentiate you. Now. Um, I've worked at two young institutions, UNLV and UCF. I celebrated 50 years at both of them, actually. Um, so I, I have a sense of what institutions at that point in their development are like. And, um, you know, I have a, a pretty strong set of convictions about where I think higher education needs to go and what the changing value proposition is for higher education. And I think we've done a lot at um, UCF to get us down that path. And, and I'll try to summarize 350 years in a couple of sentences here. Um, but you know, universities for, from the Middle Ages until very recently believed that they were um, idea generators and information disseminators. And then that thing called the internet came along. Right? Information is now free. It can't be the value proposition anymore. <clears throat> So the question becomes, well, what is the value proposition for universities? And I think it's around four things, really. I think it's about providing students with perspective. One of the things I say to students all the time is walk up to any faculty member you know and ask them one question. Whose student are you? They will have a really, really specific answer to that question. Every student should have an answer to that question. What I mean by that is an individual who have influenced how they view the world, how they think about problems, how they approach them, how they define success. And that comes through perspective. Okay. Secondly, I think it's incredibly important that students have a set of experiences that help them develop the kind of mindsets that are really necessary to succeed today. You know, um, when UCF was founded in 1963, the largest private sector employer in the United States was General Motors. And my job would have been to get one of my students into General Motors. They'd have spent their whole career there, probably in marketing or finance or whatever, right? They would have gotten a gold watch, they would have gotten a defined benefit pension plan, and they would have gotten health insurance for life. My students are gonna get none of those things. The average American changes jobs nine times by age 35. Right? A very, very different world. 
I would submit that everything that made GM successful has been turned on its head. So today, it's about risk taking and knowing how to take smart risks. It's about developing relationships with people who are really different from yourself. And we can talk about why I think that's really valuable. And it's about learning how to make um, decisions in real time using data. Right? Agility is the key today. Mindset is the key today. Entrepreneurial thinking is the key today. And it's important that students at the university have the kinds of experiences that shape those kinds of mindsets for them. Because those are the mindsets that are going to be necessary in order to succeed in the long term. And to help them to develop the relationships and the network that's going to get them to where they are. Okay? The last thing I believe, no real learning occurs without people being uncomfortable. You need to get over that. Right? I'm looking for an institution that will allow me to implement as many of those ideas as possible for as many students as possible. And that's why I'm here today. Outstanding. <coughs> Outstanding. Any follow-up questions to that? Dr. Allen. Tell me more about the uncomfortable idea you just mentioned. So what I'm talking here is about um, getting outside of your comfort zone, right? Um, putting people in new experiences, in situations that are new, having them test their skills in those new situations, debriefing with them of what they've learned from that, making them bolder in their next effort at, at, at a new experience, I think is, is really, really key, okay? Um, getting good grades is a different thing than being uncomfortable. And, um, you know, a lot of times people don't like to get out of their comfort zones. You, you, you kind of have to help them get there. Um, it also requires um, an environment in which um, it's okay to fail. So um, one of the things in, in the College of Business we have is we have a failure competition. I ask every student to write on a new experience that they've had that they failed at miserably and what they learned from that and uh, what they think other people could learn from that. We post them all online. And when we get down to the three um, semi-finalists, we have them videotape their story and then we uh, vote including the Alumni Association. So I think the most votes I've had in a failure competition is around 3,000. Uh, the winner gets a letter of recommendation from me and a $500 scholarship. And honestly, this is my war against helicopter parents, right, who are trying to engineer all of the risk and uncertainty out of their students' lives. And I think that's a really bad idea. Thank you. Because when they try to do that and they fail the first time, they don't really know how to recover from that. And we're doing them a big disservice. And, and I need to, Dr. Allen is a professor in the College of Business here. I'm sure you probably, you may know that. Um, next, and, and I've uh, failed at many things. <laughs> <laughs> and next is Mr. Harrington, who is a former Board of Trustee member of Florida Legislator in the House for the state of Florida, and he is one of our community members on the committee. I think you had a question yes, or a follow-up. Thank you, Chairman Smith. Uh, Dr. Charlie, you mentioned risk-taking, doing the smart risk. How would you discover that smart risk? So I think that um, there's a big difference between um, acting stupidly and engaging in smart risks, right? So um, one wants to evaluate what the upside is, the potential opportunity, right? And then also look at ways that you can mitigate the downside of whatever it is that you're about to engage in. So in entrepreneurship, right, we talk about exit strategies for people. Knowing before you go in what your exit strategy is going to be. Having, an under, having done your homework in terms of research so that you can evaluate those, those risks. I'm not talking about closing your eyes and jumping off the top of the cliff. Right? But I do think that um, that concept is also really close to the concept of getting people out of their comfort zones. Those things are very similar to each other. Right? Um, I think it, it also requires uh, the individual to look at themselves and have a, an assessment of what their skills and abilities are and whether they're a good fit for that challenge or opportunity that comes forward. But like with um, all decisions, especially ones that have some risk associated with it. At the end of the day, you go with your gut. <laughs> um, but the, the, less, um, the less passion you have, 
associated emotion you have with evaluating that option, the better, quite frankly, than going in with your eyes open. So taking away the fear is part of it. Does that help? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Follow-up question by Vice Chair Repsdorf. Uh, Robbie is the former chair of the Board of Trustees, is a current member of the Board of Trustees, and is just a, an outstanding person to have as a vice chair. Yeah, Ms. Repsdorf. Uh, Dr. Jarley, those are the reasons why you're intrigued and why you'd like to come here. Mm -hmm. So coming here as president, how, how do you take that down? How will you take that down? to the faculty level who is dealing with the students every day, who are in the trenches every day with them. It might be your concept, mm -hmm. but how, do you, how will you deliver that? Well, it's not, it's not my place to dictate what faculty do in individual classrooms as president or provost. I, I think um, any vision starts with a conversation with a large group of people to explain what that vision is and to get by into it. So, um, you know, when I first came to UCF, um, I spent the first three months interviewing everybody who worked for me. That was 225 interviews. They were 30 minutes long each. And I asked everybody the same three questions. What do you think of UCF? What would you do if you were me? And what do you see as your role here? I did the same thing with 125 people in the community get a sense of what they thought about the institution and where the College of Business was and where the opportunities and, and challenges associated with them are. Um, and after a lot of listening, that was followed by a lot of conversation, <laughs> right? I think that you have um, about 18 months to put your plan in place and start to get traction for it. If you haven't done it within that 18 month period, I, I don't think your chances are, are, are very, very high. But I think if you don't take those first three to six months up front to help people understand what it, to understand the institution and to help them to understand what it is that you want to do, it's very difficult to get that done. But let me, let me give you another example. So right now we're going through a strategic planning process in the college. Okay. And I've been involved in a lot of strategic planning processes that lead to nice glossy documents that sit on people's shelves and nobody pays any attention to. And universities are really great at this because they'll wait you out. <laughs> so, you, 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 right? You, yeah, you have to come up. It's good that the mic is not picking up. <laughs> um, you have to come up with um, ways to look for wins that make it real. So I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. So I, I think it's my um, responsibility after listening and talking to a number of people to give um, my colleagues, and I'm managing partner, not CEO. There's an important distinction there. Um, to give my colleagues what I call strategic intuition. And what that means is when you're faced with choice A or choice B, strategic intuition will help you determine whether you should do A or B. Okay. So um, this might sound a little hokey, but I think it's been very effective. Um, we strive to be the Tesla of business schools. So when you're facing a choice, Think about, does this make us more like Tesla, or more like Hyundai, or more like Kia? Okay. Tesla's an automobile company that's trying to provide transportation that's been provided for almost 100 years. Not new, right? Has a different engine, dis different distribution system. Um, the hope is to put one of those cars in every garage, not just people who can pay $100,000 for them. Okay. Um, and it's disrupting that market. Now, the next step in our strategic planning process is um, we put together a list of 14 questions. We pulled the faculty. Um, we took the most eight, the eight that they liked the most. We put them into work groups of five, and we said, give us your two best ideas on how to answer these questions. And think Tesla about how, it, how we would go about doing it. And from that, we will put together our strategic plan going forward. Then I think it's the uh, job of the leader to continue to talk about why it is that you're doing what you're doing, why that's important, and highlighting examples of people who are having success doing that. Because ultimately, people want to be on winning teams and they will do things that work. One follow-up <laughs> question for me. Um, when you think about being uncomfortable and you think about risk calculation, UCF is one of the 
premier schools for performance-based funding metric uh, mm -hmm. performance in the system. Give me an example of calculated risk and uncomfortableness that you would implement here given uh, our metrics and where we're at. I mean, you're kind of in a unique position versus a lot of people because your understanding of this, I'm guessing, is very near so and I dear. Can, I can tell you about a couple of calculated risks that I've taken that I think do contribute to those overall performance um, rankings. So um, mm. um, one is um, I made the decision about a year in to terminate all of my academic advisors and replace them with career coaches. Now, in full disclosure, I am married to a former academic advisor. <laughs> And it's not that uh, these individuals weren't good people trying to do good work, okay? But leadership is about making sure you're doing the right things. And we have a very large student body, most of whom come to us as juniors through the community college system, who were told, go to business school, you'll get a job in that. Well, that's true. In general, they do get a job in that eventually. Eventually, most people get jobs, right? Um, but they were not very sophisticated consumers about the educational experience that they were going to have, nor did they have much of an understanding about how those choices would influence their careers and their lifestyles going forward. So uh, we went out and we hired people from training and development and recruiting backgrounds. And so the first question we ask students when they show up in the College of Business is, what do you want to do? That's not a theoretical question for us. You need to have an answer to that question by the end of your first semester and a plan about how it is that you're going to get there. The first year we put that in place, we increased the <laughs> percentage of students who left us with a full-time job offer in hand by 11 points from having that conversation. Now, that was a really big risk. And frankly, um, the rest of campus was very, very nervous about that, quite honestly. Um, you know, we held serve last year. I think we'll do a little better this year. Uh, um, as part of that, but I, I firmly believe that universities have to own the post-graduation experience of their students. And that is not a theoretical conversation for us. The other one I would mention really quickly is the integrated business degree. So, um, again, thinking about place and moving from conception to kind of local reality. I know that 50% of the students who graduate, I, I graduate 2,100 students a year from the College of Business to put this in perspective for you. I know that 50% of them are going to stay in Central Florida. I know that 70% of them are going to stay in the state. Okay? If you look at employment in Central Florida, um, you stack um, <coughs> employers from the company that employs the most, which is Disney, 72,000 employees, all the way down. By the time you get to number um, 100, they only have 300 employees. More than half of people who work in Central Florida work for what the government would de define as a medium or small business. Okay? And they are not looking for technical experts. Okay? They are looking for people who can go across disciplines. They might be doing marketing one day and finance the next with a little accounting thrown in. And so we worked with the business community to develop a new integrated business degree to meet that need. And we project that in three years, 50% of the students in the College of Business will be integrated business students. And we think that will move those employment numbers forward. And we think it's also really fitting because we know that the careers of our students are going to be so much more varied than they were of our parents. Right? One of the challenges we have in higher education today is that um, because companies don't expect you to stay a long time, they don't train you a whole lot. You got to be able to know how to do something the day you walk out the door, right? But you also need to understand that your first job probably isn't going to be your last job or your dream job. And so you need to be thinking about what experiences and what skills are you going to get in your first job that's going to land you your next job and the job after that. And that's a mindset, right? And it's an uncomfortable mindset, but the clock is ticking and you need to prepare for that. Will we be successful? Too early to tell, right? One thing that's really different in higher ed, maybe to um, some of my business folks around the table, is my product cycle is really long. It's four years before I have any idea whether anything worked at all or not. 
Um, and, and you've got to be willing to stick with it, right? And, and kind of um, change as you go along. I hope that answered the question yeah. in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gregerson is the Dean of our Arts and Sciences College. Dean Gregerson. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jarley. Uh, so what you just described with that uh, business degree, mm -hmm. we make the same arguments for liberal arts yeah, degrees. Absolutely. So I just wanted to hear you talk about uh, the applicability of, of the way you think and manage and, and uh, uh, innovate applied across all the disciplines so, at the university. Sure, absolutely. So I, I'm a product of a liberal education. I didn't go to business school. I don't have a business degree, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, so, you know, my training is largely in economics. Um, um, I, I think that um, the thought processes there are much the same. It's simply the context that's different. So, um, you know, I, I think you could um, teach risk taking from um, a classical literature perspective, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, I think that. Um, you know, certainly in, in um, some of the medical professions as well, which are changing fairly dramatically um, these days, that that entrepreneurial kind of mindset um, is, is certainly important. I did not need, mean to suggest by my comments that I thought that uh, these were things that were going to be important simply to business students. In fact, I think they're going to be important to all students. I'm, I'm really big on bringing, uh, remember I mentioned earlier about getting to know people who are really different from yourself? Okay. I don't, necess I don't mean by that um, just gender or race or experience. I also mean discipline and disciplinary backgrounds. Uh, you know, examples of this. Um, if we hold business comp uh, sort of business plan competitions by business students, kind of like think Shark Tank, okay? Um, my, my students are going to create either a lifestyle business or an app for that. That's all they really know, right? But if I pair those students with engineering students or students from the arts or students from the sciences, uh, really, really interesting ideas come out of that. Um, they fight a lot about it. So I remember when we did this at UNLV, the engineers would come to us and they would say, those marketing students want products that defy the laws of physics that can't be done. And the business students would come to us and say, these engineering students want to build products no one will buy. And at the end of the first year of our experiments there, we had two LLCs. By the end of our second year, we had four LLCs. By our third year, every state representative was stopping by wondering what we were doing in that, in that arena, right? Um, and because of the fluidity, I think, of our students' lives going forward, the more perspectives that they're associated with, the more dots they're able to connect, the more innovative they're likely to be. So looking for those venues wherever we can find them to put students together. And I don't like to over-engineer it. I like to give them a sandbox and throw it in and see what comes out the other end. Um, you know, so I, I've worked with partners across campus on, on those kinds of activities. And I think uh, you're going to see more and more of that going forward. And certainly one of the defining um, experiences of any institution is its general education program and what students learn there and what mindsets come out of that. Does that help, sir? Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Mr. Call, you might ask a question. Uh, Mr. Call is the uh, chairman of our foundation. Mr. Call, you have the mic. All we right. thank you for your generosity, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Wish it was all mine. Uh, so, so everything we do here at Florida Gulf Coast University should be done in the context of an overall vision, in part articulated by the president. What experience have you had with articulating a vision and engaging others in its implementation? What might be your vision for Florida Gulf Coast University in a few years of your presidency? So I think the strategic planning process that I just mentioned that we've gone through at, at um, UCF would be a good example of how um, we've, I've um, taken a process and, and used it to collectively articulate a vision. Um, and you know, here, here's another thing I would say about that. Um, you don't do visions on Tuesday. That's not kind of how it works. So this needs to be an ongoing conversation with people, faculty, staff, people in the community. Um, I, I don't believe that strategic plans are, are fixed. 
I, I think they evolve over time as you learn. Um, I think it's in, incredibly important that you have conversations along the way about it. Um, I, I do think it's, it's the leader's responsibility to ultimately sharpen that vision for people and to carry it to them and, and, and to make it real. Um, but even in my lowly job, um, I understand that I don't do any of the teaching or any of the research in a building and a good day for most faculty is that they don't see me. That's where we start. Right? So if we don't capture the imagination of a core group of people who are committed to the plan and want to make the plan work, we will never succeed. So we have monthly faculty lunches in the college where we feature what we're doing. We take questions and answers from faculty. We ask for their input. We make adjustments along the way. Um, I meet with the full professors in, in the college um, two times a semester. I view them as kind of the senior partners in the firm. And uh, we call that the big boy and girl table. So everybody there gets an opportunity to ask whatever questions that they want, um, to suggest improvements in, in what we're doing. Transparency is really key as part of this. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that I can articulate you the fine line between being stubbornly adhering to your values and vision and, um, and taking advice. <laughs> um, that's, that's sort of an iterative process, I think. Um, it, it's certainly important to have both. But I would expect in any institution for me to do something similar to what I've done before. You know, there, there would be a two to three month listening period with people inside and outside of the institution. I would then start to float some ideas, right? By the end of six months, mm, I would want those ideas in writing and us to, have, to start to have more formal conversations about it. What that should look like for you, uh, too early for me to tell, really. You know, I, I think um, I need to look, know some more about who you are and uh, what your aspirations are going forward, uh, particularly in things like growth. Um, it's to get a better sense of what that would be. Right? I, I, I'm not going to walk in the door and tell you how you should be distinctive. <laughs> um, but I do think the things that I mentioned in, um, in my, answering my first question are going to be key to any institution going forward. It might be the context in which they're manifested that differs. Um, does that help? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Isran. Dr. Isran is a uh, per, or faculty member professor in the College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Isran, thank you. Follow up question. Uh, so, Dr. Darley, uh, follow up question. So, you mentioned that um, you'd like to capture the imagination of a core group of people, and mm -hmm. you gave some articulated some specific examples mm -hmm. of how you did that in a college. Um, how do you envision you would scale that up to a presidential position? Yeah. Um, I still think, given the size of this institution, right, that I would be able to use several of the same techniques, not all of the same techniques. Right? And so it would, um, well, there's a few things, though, um, you know, that I do that I would also continue that allows you to scale some. So if you haven't done so already, you should check out my blog. It's very unvarnished. Um, it, um, no one in the in the campus community has to guess what I'm thinking about the issues of the day. And that is very intentional on my part. It gives me an unfiltered way to have conversations with 9,500 students, 225 faculty and staff, and anybody else on campus or in the community who wants to listen. And that is a very active vehicle for me. <coughs> Um, certainly, um, having direct reports who are on board with that mission and who can help carry that into um, places where I can't go or don't have the time to go um, is an important part of that. Um, but, but I, you know, I think one of the key, um, really the essence of leadership is, is, is to understand that you're everyone's leader. Okay? And um, to have those conversations with them. Generally speaking, when, when people come to see me, they get 30 minutes 
you don't get more than 30 minutes. Um, the way to, that you would get more than 30 minutes is if you had a particularly interesting question or insight for me. Um, but those conversations have to go on and they go, have to go on continually. I don't think I would change that a whole lot. You know, I am, yes, there are going to be committee structures. Yes, there are going to be reports. <coughs> There's certain processes that are gone through there. But I would say a lot of committee structure and a lot of reports lead to strategic plans that get put on the shelf and nobody actually pays any attention to. So if you're not willing to do the work up front to build the consensus around that, the rest of it just really doesn't matter a whole lot, quite honestly. Did that help a little bit? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question, I think Mr. Charles Winton, he was a former chairman of the foundation and is a very successful businessman in the uh, Fort Myers and Naples community and is one of our community representative. Mr. Winton. Good afternoon, Dr. Jarley. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a Chevrolet dealer, so your comments about Tesla and General <laughs> Motors uh, resonated with me. I'm a Michigan boy, yeah. so, you know, I talk in terms of cars. <laughs> but earlier you said that you saw yourself as a managing partner mm -hmm. and not a CEO, mm -hmm. and you said that there was a distinction in that. Can you ex expound on that a little sure. bit? Sure. So, um, you know, a, a managing partner, um, the key word there would be partner, <laughs> right? So... Um, that managing partner um, serves at the uh, pleasure of the partners, represents the partner's interests, right? Um, a CEO tells other people what to do. Right? That's a very different kind of process going forward. Um, I, I have to lead um, with the consent of my partners. And uh, should I lose that consent, I don't really have anything at that point. So um, that's one of the reasons why having those conversations up front is, is so important going forward. Because if you can't capture the hearts and minds of um, the faculty and the staff um, and the students, you're not, you're not going to get that done. So um, you, you need to take an approach um, which puts you in that kind of mindset. I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next question is with Governor Ed Morton, who has been a board of trustee, a, a foundation chairman, and is now currently on the board of governors, and he is our board of governor representative. Mr. Morton, you have the mic. And, and the alumnus of FGCU. Um, I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> paid my dues. Uh, you, building on Charles' question, could you define for us broadly who are your partners? Sure. So um, there, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so um, there would be the faculty and staff in the college. There are my fellow deans across campus. There is uh, the provost and the president. And uh, then there are my partners in the community, um, both corporate partners and civic partners, who all have a stake in the institution and how it's perceived and uh, what the way forward is there. Um, and again, um, a great deal of that work gets done by um, those partners, not by me. <coughs> right. Could I follow up? Yeah, sure. I yes, would sir. submit a couple of additional partners of the legislature and the Board of Governors. Uh, performance metrics. Mm -hmm or the building block upon which we're making some changes and or some very important initiatives to both the legislature and the Board of Governors. Have you studied performance metrics and do you have any idea about those performance metrics at FGCU you would address and how would you address them? Well, the, the one that I noticed the most um, for you is that um, your retention and graduation rates need some work quite honestly. Um, it's a little hard from the outside to know exactly what that's about. Uh, you know, I, so my background's in human resources, labor relations. You know, the first place I would look would be at my selection processes. Right? Am I selecting the right set of people to be here? Or do I have a problem there? Good selection takes care of a lot of problems, quite honestly. Um, 
assuming that I don't have a problem there. Um, you know, exits from universities can be for a couple of different reasons. Um, sometimes it's financial, okay, that students don't have enough money to stay in school. Um, sometimes it has to do with problems at home of one kind or another. Um, sometimes it has to do with academic preparation. Um, so you would want to um, look at each of those buckets to determine where you think the roadblocks are. I think um, data analytics is a really important part of this process going forward. That's just at its infancy even at, at UCF. And you know, I think UCF does it probably a lot better than a lot of institutions do. Um, but you know, we're looking for courses that add curriculum and looking for courses that are indicative of what people, um, whether they succeed or not. I, th I think having really honest conversations with students at the very beginning about what their aspirations are and what their skills and abilities are and how to plot out a path for success for them is really, really important going forward. Um, I don't think enough of that gets done. I think a lot of our students today are um, not as educated as we think they are about those selection processes, right? You're not going to be an engineer if you can't do math. Having those conversations up front, I think are really, really an important part of that. Um, you know, my, my take on the performance metrics in, in general are, um, I certainly understand why the state legislature is, is interesting in incentivizing those things, but I wouldn't chase performance funding for the money. I would chase performance fund, I, I would chase the metrics because the metrics represent what are the right things to do. If they're the right things to do, the money will come, right? So the, the real key is making sure that people understand that they're the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah I would hope that form <laughs> follows function. Yes. And that the, <laughs> that the functionality that we're looking for with boards, of, with metrics, mm -hmm. would lead per, to precisely better outcome for mm -hmm. the students, the faculty, mm -hmm. the taxpayers, and everybody. It has certainly provided about. focus. There's no question about it. You know, and I, th I think the metrics around the post-graduation experience of students is, is um, certainly pushing in, in that direction. Although I will tell you that I think we at UCF benefit a bit from that because of the mix of the programs that we have as well. It's, it's not independent of that portfolio of, of what you're offering, quite honestly. Thank you. Um, Dr. Allen. It's following up briefly on Mr. Morton's question about who are your partners, um, I've heard you refer to students as consumers, as inputs to a production function, as outputs to a production function. Are they also partners? So I don't, if I said they were consumers, I didn't mean to. Okay. Um, and there's a very specific reason for that. Um, I think students are clients. There's a difference, right? So, um, you know, there's the old saying, the consumer's always right. But sometimes you have to tell clients things that are good for them, even though they don't want to hear them. Right? And so I, I, I tend to think of students in, in that respect. Okay? We have an obligation to do right by them. And um, that may include telling them things that they don't necessarily want to hear as part of that, that process. Um, they, um, whether I see them as products or not, I, I don't really have an opinion about that. Um, I do think, though, that um, we do need to own that post-graduation experience of those students. We can't be making promises to them about their great futures and not caring about what those futures are. It's not acceptable to say, you'll graduate and you'll go find yourself somewhere out there. Not good enough, I don't think. Thank you. Following up on students, Trustee Fieldings Elnius, he is the student body president and a trustee at the university. T, you may have a, he's talked about students, so you may want to expound on that a bit. Thank you. Mr. Jarley, a uh, qu question for you. you. Earlier you touched on how you hope to capture the hearts and minds of students. And you talk about, you know, addressing the performance metrics and um, making students capable of performing um, outside, post-graduate post life. Can you describe or 
give an example of any meaningful conversations that you've had with students to really understand the, the, the overall student experience to address some of those issues and concerns? Sure, so I have, I have monthly lunches with students. Um, we invite them in at random. It's usually 30 or so. It's harder to get above that. If you get above 30, students get quiet on you. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that um, we have in the College of Business at UCF is the uh, different experiences between our FTICs, the students who start with us as freshmen, okay, and their success rate, versus the students who transfer in as juniors from one of our partner institutions. Okay? Um, and un understanding why we're seeing the disparity in, this, in the experiences and the success rates of those students and developing responses to that is really important, okay? So, you know, and, and one of the things that we've learned during that process is the students who come from our community college um, partners come from a very different culture of an institution, okay? And are in a very different physical setting than happens when they come to me at UCF. So typically they're in very small classes, um, 25 to 30, okay? Um, they are able to retake exams as part of their way of demonstrating um, their mastery of, of the program. Um, they get a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one guidance from people. Then they come to the College of Business at UCF. My largest class at UCF has 2,000 students in it. And if you stand in the back and wait to see what that experience is going to be like, we will run over you. So um, this year, we've put a whole process in place um, with the help of our student ambassadors um, to help students transition from that community college experience to the College of Business experience and navigate those waters so they're more likely to be successful in the college <coughs> um, after their first year. And we included a bunch of students in creating that onboarding process for all of our students going forward. That would be a, a real typical one. Um, you know, but the other conversation that's really, really common with students, and it's independent of their GPA. It's independent on that at all. They don't know what they want to do. And helping them think through that process and how they can learn what they want to do um, while they're with us. Um, those conversations go on every day in the building. Thousands of them. Does that help? Dr. Isren, do you have a question? Uh, should I, can I, I'm just gonna ask one from. Oh, absolutely, okay. how about it? All right, um, Florida Gulf Coast University's shared governance uh, mm -hmm. tradition brings together faculty, staff, and students. We would like to know what shared governance means to you, especially the role you feel as a president should take in shared governance. How would you assess the will of these different constituencies? constituencies? In addition, could you please um, speak to any role that you have had working in a unionized faculty? My faculty are unionized at UCF. <laughs> so um, I've had five years of experience doing that. I come from a labor relations background. This, this is sort of what I used to teach. So th that part comes pretty naturally um, for me. In, 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 in terms of governance, um, we are a community of scholars. And in fact, when I, it's interesting how institutions are really different. Okay, so when I was at UNLV, the biggest problem I had is that people knew each other too well. And what I mean by that is faculty would be re-arguing things that happened 30 years ago, made me crazy. Okay. Um, when I came to UCF, I had the opposite problem. I could line up faculty from one department in a room and ask other faculty to point a finger and tell me who they were and they wouldn't be able to do that. And you cannot have a collective sense of purpose and vision and governance if people don't know each other's names. So we went on a year and a half uh, mission to have weekly meetings with people um, to start those conversations um, so that people got to know each other better and um, could um, provide me with input into those processes. I, I benefit from the fact I have a really, really great group of faculty. And they are very, very committed people. Um, 
you know, curriculum is something that obviously sits with the faculty. It's the faculty's responsibility to develop that curriculum and to teach that curriculum and to prepare our students. And that is not something that administration should be telling the faculty to do. Okay. Um, faculty in my institution play a very large role in promotion and tenure processes. It would be a very rare instance where I would disagree with my colleagues about a promotion and tenure case where they were unanimous in their opinions about what should happen there. I don't tell faculty what their department should be when they grow up. They tell me. Okay. I don't get involved in trying to influence what research goes on in the building. Research is the uh, most personal thing that our faculty members do. You don't administrate your way to research greatness. That's not how that works. The simple best thing that I can do is hire really great people with fire in their bellies and have conversations with them about how to move that institution ahead. That works really, really well. And as long as we do that in an environment which is civil, sometimes we're going to disagree. Sometimes I have to make a call, right? But I would say in the almost five years that I've been in, at, at UCF, I don't believe we've had one single controversy. Not one. That's because, and I think it's because we put the time on the front end to talk through those things. Mr. Harrington, do you have a follow-up question, or is or is it a new question? Because Ms. Nolan would like to ask a question as well. I'd like to ask a question based on what was just okay. said, if I may. Okay, follow up with Mr. Harrington. Thank you. Uh, you talked about staff having uh, the freedom, the faculty having the freedom to to go about uh, uh, teaching, instructing, and, and 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 doing what they have to do uh, in the departments. How do you made up the strategic plan and the goals of the strategic plan with that freedom and independence? How do you hold them accountable? Oh, I think accountability is a bit of a different issue than the strategic plan is. So, um, you know, the, the, the strategic plan is about investment and, and general direction and some of the administrative procedures that we're going to put in place. Um, but what faculty do in there, I mean, there's a performance evaluation system yes. that we have in place, and that performance evaluation system needs to be aligned with the strategic plan in the sense that if we say we want people to do X, we should reward X, <laughs> right, and, and, and not Y. Um, and um, as um, I, I, I mentioned in the, in the um, answer to the, um, the last question, you know, we're a unionized environment. At, at UCF. So we have something called the, the AESP. It's the Annual Evaluation of Faculty Performance or something like that. Um, and so there is a very long document which describes how faculty are evaluated in terms of teaching, research, and service. Okay? And uh, we have just gone through a process in the College of Business. We've kind of pioneered this um, to move to kind of a bit of a different evaluation system for faculty which requires more give and take and more feedback um, with a, fa with a um, faculty member interacting with their chair. Performance evaluations in academic settings, at least at the level I'm at, and put my direct reports aside for a minute, I'll come back to them, okay? Um, that's done at the department level. It's the department chair's responsibility to provide good developmental and administrative feedback to faculty members. If I have a department chair who won't do that for the department, I will get a new department chair. I've done that twice. People have to have honest evaluations. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. Um, but that's about the department chairs doing their jobs or um, the deans doing their jobs, <laughs> as, as, as the case may be. You know, for me, that would be in, in, in a role of president or even in my role, quite frankly. Um, you know, I do those evaluations of my direct reports who have milestones that have to be reached as part of a strategic plan, mm -hmm. for example. But, but sometimes, um, and I, I, I think this happens sometimes, I think, in higher ed in particular. S sometimes, in, in, in my humble view, um, goals and strategies get confused a little bit. So growth is not a strategy. It's an outcome. It's an outcome from a set of behaviors that you want to engage in. 
Okay? But to say our strategy is to grow, that, that, that's not a strategy. That's an outcome. Okay? Um, we want more of our students to get employed. That's an outcome. Now, there are steps you can take to get there. That's a different thing. But it's not a strategy. Does that make sense to folks? Thank you. Yeah. One final question, uh, Ms. Pamela Nolan, who is a community member, a respected business leader in Lee County. Uh, this will be the last question before we turn it back to you to ask us questions. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Jarley, what has prepared you to serve as the external face of FGCU in the community, and how would you ensure that these relationships are cultivated and enhanced? So, um, I think the best part of my story, quite frankly, is with what me and my team have done in the community in the, in the four years that I've been at, at UCF. Um, we took an institution, the College of Business. So when I would go out, and I, when I first came to UCF, and I would go meet with business people or community people, and I would say, hi, I'm Paul Jarley. I'm the new dean of the College of Business at UCF. Here's the first two questions I would get. How's Dr. Hitt doing? <laughs> <laughs> John been there 23, 24 years. You know, I mean, he's going to be the face of the institution. Right. Next question. How many students do you have at UCF now? Okay. Not a word about the college business. Not one. Now, that's good news and bad news, right? At least I'm not getting a lot of negatives <laughs> here. I get a chance to put some paint on that canvas, right? Uh, but boy, that canvas is blank. <laughs> um, so. Um, you know, one of the things, an action that we do, um, tomorrow will be one of them. Um, every month I have a, a breakfast at the Citrus Club in downtown Orlando where we feature a faculty member who does a TED Talk for 20 minutes. I challenge the faculty, give me your best 20 minutes and don't suck, right? And then we, we have about another 40 minutes of conversation between the audience and that faculty member around what it is that they do. And, and we probably average somewhere between 60 and 120 guests, depending upon kind of the topic and, and, and the person. Um, I've eaten a lot of chicken dinners, really, really a lot of them, probably a couple a week uh, in, in going out into the community um, to network with people, um, to have speaking engagements. You know, you have to tell the story wherever, wherever you can. Um, also, um, this might be my best idea ever, quite honestly. Um, and, and it's a way to scale intimacy. It's a way to link to the community. And it's a way to show donors assets um, that they might want to invest in. So a year ago, I opened a facility in the college called The Exchange. And the idea behind The Exchange is every day, we have someone from the community talking to at least 120 students about something that's important to their future. So um, we've had the mayor in to talk about his vision for Orlando. We've had many people in the business community come in to talk about their industry and how their industry is changing and how their company competes in that industry and what students could do if they wanted to be part of that industry. I interviewed a couple last week on what it's like to be a power couple and how they, how they balance um, all of the stress that they have that, that's associated with that. My goal was to have one a day, we do three a day. And this is, one of the, this is the great story of UCF, right? We don't do anything small at UCF. In a year, I've had 175 exchanges involving more than 17,000 students. And um, you know, um, a university becomes a better university when you've spoken at it. It's kind of funny how that works, really. But um, you know, people leave with good feelings. They had a good impression. They got engaged by a, a, a group of students. Um, good all the way around. Thank you, Dr. Jarley. So at this point, we'll turn it over to you. Um, we have about uh, what would appear to be, I can't read my notes here, about 18 minutes uh, okay. for you to ask us questions. I'm trying to do math, not my forte. I wouldn't have been an engineer, obviously. Um, <laughs> But, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, and you feel free to ask questions. I'd ask the question to me, and then I'll redirect sure. to somebody so we don't end up in a lot of people talking at once. So the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so the first question, Florida Gulf Coast is 20. Okay. Um, if you were to paint a picture of what you would like to see Florida Gulf Coast look like at 40, what would it look like? 
that's why we're talking to you. <laughs> so let me ask it a different way. Okay, let me ask it a different way. I did. I asked this question when I first came when I first came to UCF. I asked, and I'll even give you what that answer is. I like the best, and then let's see. If, let, let's play this game then. So if if Florida Gulf Coast University was a person, who would it be? Not me. Okay. So my favorite, my favorite answer at UCF was a young Shaquille O'Neal. Large, a little awkward on the court, has a lot of high potential, needs some coaching. Pretty good answer, I thought. I Probably agree. better than Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, that, was a, that was a pretty good answer. That is, yeah. I thought. My second favorite answer wasn't a person, it was an animal. It was Eeyore. Thanks for noticing me. <laughs> Which I also thought was pretty insightful that is funny. Um, at the time. I, I think that, you know, so from my perspective, I think that's the million dollar question is we all recognize um, as a faculty, as a, as a, let as me a ask board it, of trustees. Let me ask it in a different okay. way then, if I may, kind of, to help spark a little discussion. What do you think are the unique assets in your community and in your region that the university can leverage and partner with? to turn it into a distinctive place. If I... <laughs> Mr. Morton, go ahead. Just, as long as you don't I, say I think you framed that a little bit better. Okay. <laughs> uh, how would you leverage the financial strengths of this community and what would FGCU be known for given the profile of Southwest Florida and the desire of our Board of Governors and the legislature and everyone else so that each of our universities has an identity, a particular identity mm -hmm. that is a bright line of distinction mm -hmm. so that what are, we, what are we going to be known for? And you have to leverage the local communities. Mm -hmm. I under, we understand that. So are you familiar with Southwest Florida? And if you are... Not, an, not enough yet. That's one of the reasons I'm asking the question. Okay. Well, uh, I think we all would have it, you know, it's like describing an elephant. Mm -hmm. It depends on our perspective, how mm -hmm. we might describe the animal, mm -hmm. and it's a very unique, in, unique mm -hmm. animal from my, from my own perspective. Uh, we, we have a very unique community in terms of affluence in parts of it and, and, and poverty in others, and a uh, very unique healthcare community, very unique uh, hospitality community. But I'd be, you know, I think your challenge and our challenge is to identify those unique strategic strengths that we have as a community and weaknesses and to build build upon the strengths and to fortify the weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I would yeah, I would I'm not surprised to hear that hospitality would be something that you would be really interested in here. Um, you know, but I think it's really important to have these conversations because sometimes you can miss things um, if you don't. So for example at UCF, right? When most people think of UCF, they think about the mouse, right? <laughs> the, 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 next, the next thing they think about is the Cape. You know, UCF was originally Florida Technological University. It was, it was actually created for the Cape. It's not surprising that we have the strongest optics and photonics program in the world there, right? I mean, that makes, that makes perfect sense. But, um, you know, people don't think about some other things that are in Central Florida that are at least as important, quite frankly, to the development of UCF going forward. Uh, simulation and training would be one of those. Uh, the large number of defense contractors that are in the region would be another one of those. Um, and, and so uh, getting out in the community and, and talking through those kinds of things, I think, are going to be important to shaping that vision. I thought I saw something in your strategic plan about a college of public health going forward. Was that in the plan? Or maybe I don't think in an it's not necessarily just, plan? yeah, uh, you know, and I, I think that's how I'd answer it. I think we, we as a collective group, uh, the trustees, the faculty, the deans, the administration put a lot of time into trying to get a strategic plan that maybe, as you said, wasn't the typical shiny, put it on a shelf, we did it, check the box. So I think we've got a good footprint of what do we want to be uh, down the road. I think we've put some what we, I think we refer to as pillars in there, um, entrepreneurship, um, the health colleges, um, and some of those kind of things. Um, I think we also had some misses, and so I would tell you, um, we didn't do enough with the arts and things like that, which our friends in the arts have made a huge point. We, we do service this area. Uh, we are the cultural center of Southwest Florida. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes because we know we're really good at that, sometimes we forget to put those things yeah. in a plan, as you well know. Yeah, yeah. But So I think, we, I think what we want to be in 40 years is we've kind of drawn a road map, and that's on paper now. So the next president needs to come in and evaluate those things that we've done and where do we take the strategic plan it may need to be 
thrown in the trash and started over. But I think we've given somebody a roadmap of here's collectively what we think we want to be. How do we get there? And I agree with your your analogy that um, increased anything is an outcome. What we need now is a strategic partner um, for the faculty, for the board of trustees and the community to help us find our way to greatness. And no doubt we have a lot of things that at the university we don't talk about enough. Um, hospitality being one of them, quite frankly. But um, so I think we've given a roadmap to somebody to come in, and it's a clean slate to take that and either go forward with it or come back and say, look, I, I think after um, 180 days or whatever, these are things we're missing or we should change. So I think that it's a whiteboard that someone's going to come in and really have an opportunity to really figure out what are we going to be known for, and that is. Um, the Board of Governors, the Governor himself has told many of us he wants to know what we're going to be known for. So I think that's the challenge is we've given the, the foundation, we have a great faculty, a great uh, student body, um, we have a great community support. It's now time to bring that next individual with a fresh set of eyes to say what are we going to be when we grow up, if you will, from age 20 to age 40. So a couple of things if I could reinforce yes. just to be clear. Okay. Um, there are so mm -hmm. I'm going to say a few disjointed things here. I'll try to tie them together. So at one level, one of the biggest values that um, happens when you bring in someone from the outside to lead an institution is you get someone from the outside to lead the institution. And what, what I mean by that is there's a very short period of time in which that person can see the institution like outsiders see it. And you know, it's, it's always my strategy to try to hold on to that as long as I can, but it's really tough to do it for more than a couple of years, quite honestly, if you're trying to get anything done. Um, but you should really take advantage of that as a leader. Um, you know, I, I always give the tip that you should keep a book with you, I keep one. On everything I see in the first like six to eight months, they just sort of slap me in the face, right? And, and just kind of write them down and make a note about them. Because after that, the place starts to seem like it's just background. It kind of fades into everything, and you kind of forget about them. And sometimes those are the most defining things about the institution, right? Um, and, and you only get that opportunity once, because once you start developing your agenda, you get attached to that agenda, right? Other things start, start to happen. Um, and I think it's also the time when people in the community and in, in the legislature and other people who are partners here um, are likely to be as most candid with you about what's going on and, and what needs to be done. So it's really important as, as part of that that you avail yourself of that opportunity. Then in terms of distinctiveness, let me say a couple of things. One is um, it's going to be increasingly important in the future to know what those community assets are and to partner with those community assets to develop that. But don't forget culture. Okay. Um, you need to have a serious conversation around what does it mean to be a Florida Gulf Coast University student? What does that mean? Right? And, and what are they going to leave with? And that can be incredibly defining if you think really intentionally about it and the kinds of experiences and mindsets that you want to put in your students. Frankly, I would argue with you that's going to be more defining than those other assets are. And at least um, the other thing that's really great about that is it's almost free. It doesn't really cost a lot to do that. Right? And part of my point about size is if you create a certain culture with a certain set of assets, that will naturally bring to it a certain number of people. Now you've got to pay the bills. Right? So that, that's got to be that's got to be a viable scale for you. But if, if you're doing that and that works for you, that should be good. <laughs> right? That's my point about you need to know not only what you are, but what you're not. So if you're our, our general, our, our GM car dealer over here, okay, you don't sell hamburgers. Not to say hamburgers aren't a good thing, <laughs> right? That's just not what we do here. You know, I think that conversation is the most critical conversation that you can have going forward. Other 
questions back or we're going to let you <laughs> ask another question, Dr. Jarley. I, I can. Yeah, go. Um, yeah, please do. So talk a little bit about, I'm going to pick on Mr. Call over here. Um, you're, you're a very young institution. Um, development for Florida Gulf Coast is certainly a different proposition than it is um, at, at UF, <laughs> is, is that fair um, to say? Um, so, so tell me a little bit about your experience um, in, in trying to bring the Florida Gulf Coast message to the community and what you've heard. In so I can take it? Yes, Mr. Call. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, uh, so, so I'm early into this. I've, I've been now in my second year. Uh, so there's some other chairs from uh, the foundation that may be able to chime in as well, and I'd welcome that. But uh, we have a $100 million campaign going, and, and we feel very confident we will reach that uh, by our 20th year, which is next year. Um, so giving is definitely... Uh, we try to cultivate our alumni, but our alumni, our oldest alumni is probably not 35 years old if they, uh, you know, went to, so, and then down from there, right? So, so uh, we definitely want to cultivate that and continue to keep them active, but it truly is coming from our communities uh, and then obviously grants and the other areas, but for our job, it's, it's pretty much around our communities. And we have a very uh, giving, uh, Communities, uh, in Naples, uh, Collier, Lee, and on up the coast has uh, been very giving to us. So uh, we have, and they don't do it just because, right? They, they've done it because they are a part of this organization. I think uh, somebody said this earlier that, that they've, a lot of our founders are still here uh, and, and take a lot of pride in that. And, and that spreads throughout our communities enough to keep this, thing going, I, I would have never thought $100 million was the right answer for a campaign. And when I stepped in and they said that when our uh, director said that's what he wanted to do, I, I was uh, taken back. But we've, we're doing it and doing it very strongly. So I, I think the answer from, from my perspective is that the community is prideful because it is a 20-year uh, university that they built. And so it's not 200 years old that they had no idea about the beginning. The beginning was right before them and, and still here. So, uh, and I agree with the next 20 years, the question earlier is where will we go with this now? And so uh, I think that's what we're struggling with and, and we'll try and decide. But, but as far as giving, I think we are in a very uh, good position, but we got to stay there and increase it. Others that might uh, want to follow up from, yes, Mr. Winton. Dr. Jarley, I would uh, concur with David Call. I think the university is so young that all of us in this community are sort of like a helicopter parent almost, I guess. <laughs> and we take ownership in it. And uh, when Dr. Bradshaw first approached me about serving on the foundation board, I saw something vibrant, something growing, and I wanted to be part of that. And I think our youthfulness as a university helps us uh, garner funds from the community, but also it's our weakness. Because it's hard for us to be objective about our 20-year-old baby. And so we probably do need a different perspective, somebody to tell us how to grow our baby into a vibrant 40-year-old. Thank you. Uh, dean Gregerson. Yeah, i just say from a developmental development point of view from a dean, um, I'll echo everything uh, Mr. Call said, Mr. Winton. Um, for the most part, although we, we certainly engage with our alumni and they're going to be an increasingly important uh, aspect of this, we're working with people who are um, themselves alums of Columbia or University of Michigan or Ohio State or Rutgers or they've got an affinity to their institution. Um, and so we have to have a different type. They give to those institutions probably very generously, 
because of their personal connection when they were an undergraduate or graduate student. It's a different type of relationship with someone who wants to invest in a university, a, a very young university, but we're not their sort of primary affinity that we don't tug on the heartstrings the same way. So I think for a, a president, a, a, a vice president for development or a dean, uh, it's a different, it's a little bit different approach and you have to, you have to be very thoughtful about sort of those divided loyalties, if you will, that in some cases are very, very strong, but they also, in many cases, feel very, very connected to FGCU as well. So it's, it's an interesting and I think a, a, a wonderful challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mr. Harrington, I'll let you go and that'll be the final comments. Thank, thank you. Uh, I've been involved in politics in our community for 28 years. I live up, up the coast here in Charlotte County, uh, just out of about 30, 40 minutes away. Uh, I think our university can be whatever the university community wants it to be. I think there's a great need for local government instruction. Uh, I see decisions being made uh, in our local county that I think are wanting for uh, an ability to, to be able to really delve into the question uh, and, and come up with the right answer. Uh, the population uh, is always has a different uh, answer for what the decisions are being made by local government. Uh, we need help in our school systems to improve the education so we bring better people to the community level, I mean to the college level. Uh, I think we have a vast history, it's over 500 years old here in Southwest Florida, that we don't dare to explore. We don't look at it, we don't, we don't entertain it. And there's a couple of groups that, that that uh, have been dallying in it for you know two or three decades now, but it, uh, this Spanish colonial history we have is just unbelievable. Uh, the environment, the Gulf, the Bay, uh, again a great treasure that needs to, which which we're working on here at the university. Uh, the other thing, having knocked on thousands of doors, in Lee and Charlotte, DeSoto County, Hardy County, uh, you learn that there's such a wealth of experience that if we could somehow engage them within the university community and, and, and take advantage of that, and we do in some ways, but there's such a wealth there, and we have also a lot of very successful people in business that have donated well to the school, and, uh, and uh, we continue to reach out you know, to, to them. Uh, our history in agriculture, yeah, you know, we're not a land-grant school, but uh, I just feel that there's so many scientific challenges before the ag industry today, and I wish their university could be touching in, in that in some, some little way or some major way. There's some, we're in need of some grand answers right now, some big answers. Uh, and again, health care. We're an older, you look at all these counties put together, we probably are the oldest community in the nation, <laughs> average age-wise. And that's an asset. It is an asset. Really, it is. And uh, we need to be able to take care of those people and uh, look out for them and uh, make life much easier for, for them. Uh, that's just several things that I've always had in the back of my mind about our school. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, Dr. Jarley, I, I, we've enjoyed talking to you today, and I want to thank you on behalf of the committee for uh, coming down and visiting with us today and your interest in being the next president at FGCU. And uh, I just appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today. Well, it, it's been a pleasure in the small world in which we live. One last story. Um, Dick Pegnetter gave me my first job mm. in higher education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, isn't That's that awesome. funny how it yeah. comes around? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was sorry to see Dick pass. Oh, yeah. He's quite a guy. Oh, yeah. well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Committee, we will stand in recess for 15 minutes. Um, our next interview will start at 2.30. Thank you.
University or FGCU as you will hear us affectionately refer to it today. Um, committee, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Ken Harmon. He has a great first name, by the way. Um, <laughs> Dr. Harmon is the Provost and Vice President for Acad Academic Affairs at Kennesaw State University. And we like Kennesaw State, especially when we beat you in basketball um, and any other sport we can name. Um, you didn't think I wasn't going to bring that up. It's, it's a nice warm welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Dr. Well, Smith. The, yes. the good part of that, Dr. Harmon, is you've acknowledged that we beat you a lot. So good, that was good. I know um, what side of the table I'm sitting on, sir. I think yes, sir. Um, well, we're pleased to take the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Um, our schedule provides for 55 minutes of committee questions to you. And then we're going to reverse the situation and let you ask us questions for 15 minutes that you might have. Um, I will uh, indicate when we reach the 15 minute mark, I try to do that a little bit ahead of time so everybody, we can get some last questions in. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to do today. Um, and I think with that, I will ask the first question. Um, so why Florida Gulf Coast University and why um, at this point in your career would you want to be the next president of Florida Gulf Coast University? Great question. Let me also just start off, once again, as I said to a few of you, thank you. Thank you uh, for this honor. It's, it's a real pleasure. And uh, so I look forward to this. Uh, why FGCU? Why now? Why am I interested in this? I'm going to give you a multi-part answer. Let me first start off with I would not be interested in something if it didn't, did not look like it had a lot of potential and would be a lot of fun. When I look at what you've done here, you've built something that's already incredible. 20 years about into your existence and you already have 15,000 students. You have about a third of those students, if I recall my numbers correctly, um, about a third of those students living on campus. And then when I look at the leadership profile I'll be very honest and say that was one of the most compelling leadership profiles I have ever read. What it said to me, it painted a picture of a university that said, we know who we are. At least that's what it said to me. The types of colleges you have, if I recall, five colleges, the nature of those colleges. You have not said we're going to be everything to everyone. And there's also something that's in that profile and who you are that says, we're going to connect here. We're going to connect to this region. We're going to connect to these students. And so when I look at that, I then think back to my own history. And I'm not going to take you all the way back through my various career moves, but more my, my latest when I got to Kennesaw State. Uh, 2006, we had 19,000 students. We were mostly a commuter campus and a not so great six year, first time, full time graduation rate. To use a little bit of in the weeds lingo. Here we are at Kennesaw State about 10 years later. We're now about just a little over 35,000 students. Now, some of that's from a merger that we have, but a lot of it's just growth. And I'm not saying growth for sake of growth is just a great thing, but there's also a changed dynamic there. We converted that campus from mostly commuter to a true destination campus where students felt like they belong. They had a connection because we realized that student engagement is more than just academics and advising, even though that's extremely important. It's everything about their life on campus. And we don't have the percentage on campus that you do. And then I come forward and we have improved by 12 percentage points that six year graduation rate. Now one thing that tells you is it was really bad before. It's better now and we're on the way to get even better. And so it's, when I look at Florida Gulf Coast, I see a place that does have this incredible foundation, and I mean that sincerely. I see a place that connects with some things that I have done, or I shouldn't even say I, that I've been involved with as part of a great team. And I see what the potential is. 
And I'm going to also be, because there was another part in that question, at least that I heard, and why at this point in my career and also another reason why here. I will tell you also that in May of this year, uh, I made the decision that this would be the year based on my children's ages and other factors that it would be the year that I'd say, I'm gonna see if there's something interesting out there. I'm happy where I am, I have a great situation, but I said, I'm gonna take a look. So I decided this would be the year to take a look. And this is going to sound unusual, but I think you would understand it. This is a great place. I had been near here uh, a few times, doing some fishing up in Tampa or in Isla Morada or different places like that, but I'd never really been through here. And about three years ago, I came through a, uh, on a motorcycle ride. This is an annual event with me and my best friend. We've been best friends since we were 10 years old, and we do an annual motorcycle trip. And it's usually out west, and we did one through Florida, down one side and up the other. And we stopped in here for a while, and we just kept saying, wow, this is a great area. It's a wonderful place to be. And so even in just, I guess, somewhat coincidentally, uh, my family and I um, came down here and even vacationed during this past year. And again, realized what a great place it is. So I won't deny that that's very attractive as well. So it looks like a great place that has built this wonderful foundation. It looks like that foundation connects to my past. It looks like something fun to build. It also is the right time of my life to take a look at something, but only something if it's right. And it's a great place to live. Dr. Sharon Isrin, she's a faculty member in the Arts and Sciences uh, College. Uh, Dr. Isrin, you have the mic. Uh, thank you. Yes. I have a follow-up question. Okay. Um, you mentioned that in the years that you've been at Kennesaw State, you've uh, um, helped to turn it from a commuter campus to a destination campus um, to make the students feel that they were apart and belonged. Uh, what was your specific role in doing that? My specific role was I was part of the um, uh, working directly in the cabinet and even directly as the number two with the president um, with uh, developing things like um, athletic programs. It's, I guess it's no secret that we developed a football program. Uh, so we did do that. Uh, as part of the team that also uh, increased the number of student organizations, uh, the type of connections on campus, also, we did a much more engagement uh, kind of outreach and engagement reported to me and engagement meant student engagement and community engagement. So it meant student to student, student to university and student to community types of engagement as well. And that office reported to me for a number of years. We've since then have moved that over to a separate vice president. That's a new role that uh, just came in, I guess, uh, about a year ago. Um, so I, I, like I say, I wouldn't claim personal credit, but I've been part of the team that's developing all of these things. Also the uh, building of additional um, residence halls. And I'm also on that group that assesses the viability of residence halls and that made a big difference as well. Trustee Fielding Elnius, he is the student body president and a trustee at the university and um, I'd like for you to offer up a question concerning students. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dr. Harmon, uh, could you, you talked about uh, the student life on campus um, at Kennesaw. Could you um, give or describe a, a more meaningful conversation you've had with students and how that conversation helped you and your leadership address some student concerns and things mm -hmm. that impact the overall student culture? Um, a, a very recent example, but I'm actually going to give you uh, another one that's, that's a little deeper. Recent examples are just some concerns that students have brought to me about availability of classes and just some things like that. And so we've talked about that, which is actually a huge concern right now. But I'm going to go back to about a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, that we had a, um, we had a student and this is something that made national news. 
there was a student who was going to an advising center. And the student put all of this on, um, on video. We had an advisor come out to that student and to say the least was not kind to that student. Um, furthermore, this was an African-American student. And it sparked a great controversy. And like I say, it actually hit national news. And so I made the point to reach out to the student to say, I would like to meet with you and talk to you. First, I wanted to make sure I apologized to that student because nobody should ever be treated the way this student was treated. But we got, in, got into a much deeper discussion about his experiences on campus, how he had been treated by, and we talked about various offices, and it showed me just something about students and how they were bounced around when coming to advising. We also talked about the possible role of race in that discussion. And we had just some very candid and actually just fantastic discussions about that. And it gave me insight about into what some students go through and just trying to deal with day-to-day -day life on campus. And like I say, it also gave me insight into perhaps race relations on campus. Indeed, this sparked a larger um, flurry, if you will, that coincided with some of the Missouri incidents. And from that, uh, the Black Lives Matter group became involved. And so I sat down with those students as well to hear what they were concerned about, what we could do better. And so we had some, I thought it was some wonderful, candid conversations about what we could do and what their lives were like. And so to me, it was quite enlightening. Dr. Isern. So as a result of those discussions, were any changes implemented on campus? Yes. Uh, with advising, we immediately, one, we immediately moved that advisor out of advising. That was just a very short term. Uh, moved another person in there, actually a person from another college into that advising center because this person is someone who had done research on uh, diversity. And so she also had some administrative expertise and, and she was just known to be very good at going in and making things happen. So we moved her into that office and to oversee that office, and we, then we actually pulled the office together so that we didn't just have splintered advising. And then that actually started a larger discussion about advising on campus and how we had splintered pieces of advising and different experiences in advising. So we now have actually generated a, uh, we've, we've brought on board an advising director for the entire campus and that reports uh, up through me, uh, to the senior vice provost, then to me. Uh, but we have worked together to create what we call a common advising experience so that we know what students are experiencing out there. So that all started actually at that time. Mr. Morton. Mr. Morton is uh, our Board of Governors representative, <laughs> and uh, he, is, he was a uh, former trustee here at the university also was a former uh, chairman of our foundation so he yeah. and he is an alumni of Florida Gulf Coast University so I'm, I'm going to catch it all by the time we get done but Mr. Morton <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the mic and, and I made the mistake of looking at the chairman <laughs> <laughs> correct you looked uh, over so I got you <laughs> so somewhat ad lib uh, <clears throat> in your response your initial response to the inquiry of those who would be interested in the presidency and in, in your response to that. Yes, sir. You touched on performance metrics mm -hmm. and um, your experience in dealing with accountability and, if you will, pay for performance. Yes. Uh, can you give us any ideas with specificity of what you have done and what you might do to improve the 
for your first time in college graduation rate, excess credits, and the cost to students in the terms of borrowing. I might also add, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, yes, please. I have a child who's currently enrolled at FGCU and a grandchild who is taking a course at FGCU. So I have a lot of different perspectives. So <laughs> what help can you give me on holding down tuition costs? <laughs> <laughs> that just changed to a different question. Um, yeah. I will, um, we, uh, in, in Georgia, there was talk about going to a performance funding formula similar to the Florida formula. And I'm familiar with the, the 10 metrics there, et cetera. Uh, we've talked about it. It has not actually come into being at this point, but we've at least had the discussion. What happened, though, at that time, we started what we call Complete College Georgia, which is uh, underneath the umbrella of Complete College America. And Complete College Georgia says exactly that. You need to start tracking all of these metrics, and you need to tell us what kind of actions you're taking to improve those metrics. And every year we now have to prepare a report that goes into the university system office to examine those types of metrics. And that is in my office. Uh, in fact, we have, um, we have restructured at this point so that a, we had a senior vice provost, that person left, and so we actually kind of uh, reconfigured that position to primarily be in charge of student success from an academic perspective, and they do work well with student affairs as, as well. What we have learned at this point is, number one, advising makes a huge difference. Professional advising makes a huge difference. And in fact, there are other things we can do with block scheduling, de facto schedules. I mean, there's a lot of different things where you can do opt-outs um, we won't go into all of those details, but those types of things make a difference. What we also find, something we frequently say, is there are some students who are a flat tire away from enrolling in school that semester. Because we know that money makes a difference. So one thing that we have done, we haven't done enough of, but we've done, is we've actually raised money for what we call gap scholarships. And so students go and they're in there and they're talking to the financial aid folks and they're trying to register and they're, you know, they're $500, $700 away. We can go find that money and say, go ahead and enroll. We're going to help you through. So we do find that money makes a difference just even at very small levels. And we, there's a whole national discussion on those types of funds as well. Um, so again, advising, we've tried something else with some smaller groups, it's a little more expensive per student, but it, I think it probably pays off, is something called graduation coaches. Where somebody's not just an advisor, uh, for lack of a better term, I call it concierge service. Where if I have a question about whether it's residence halls, whether it's financial aid, getting into classes, whatever that might be, I need somebody to go to. And this goes back to my earlier point about it, it breaks my heart to hear students talking about, well, I had to go here and was sent over here, then was sent over here, then was sent over here, and I remember those days. And that's not welcoming. And so this idea that somehow we can be more welcoming and friendly and customer focused and make sure that their experience is one where we help them through. And so then we look at some other things. We talk, you talk about excess hours, we call it the super seniors and things like that, um, which is a bit of a misnomer, I guess. Uh, but it happens oftentimes, one is oftentimes happens with transfer students. And that's where we also need to have better relationships with the transferring institutions. And we have tried to do some of that. We actually put advisors out into some of those institutions. Um, also though, we need to look at the offering of classes. I mean, it sounds real simple. But what happens sometimes if a student can't get into a certain class just to make a schedule, they'll enroll in something 
that really doesn't take them toward their degree. And so we need to have, get rid of bottlenecks. And that's one thing we are facing dramatically right now. There are these bottleneck classes where um, I'm dealing with, gosh, I can't tell you how many different disciplines right now because we had such an influx of, of freshman students. Um, and so we're scrambling to find instructors in space just to get them to classes because otherwise they're going to fill up a schedule with something else and they're going to have excess hours. And so that makes a difference as well. Also, we can look at things like fees. We have found that fees make a big difference and so we're taking a hard introspective look at fees. Also the cost of textbooks. And this is actually, I've, I've been at national meetings talking about this and that cost of textbooks can be driven down oftentimes by technology in some fashion. And so the whole state of Georgia has had this initiative to have, actually pay people to write text and do things that can then become open source. And so there are some things we can take a hard look at because that cost of textbooks can get quite expensive and that can add significantly to that cost of education as well. So it's this whole, it's this whole assortment of interventions that we can take and I'm going to throw one last thing on, even though I'm giving you probably a lengthier answer than what you had asked for. And that is, when I go back to advising, we're actually bringing on some software that will give very early alerts if there are issues with a student to try to help them through that process. And there could be academic issues, there could be other types of issues, it depends, on, and we're in the process of, of putting in the metrics that we would use there, um, where we can have alerts come up and there can be an in, what we call intervention type of advising to call the student in and say, uh, it looks like you may have an issue here, what do we need to do to get you some help, some supplemental instruction, some tutoring, whatever that might be. So it's a whole assortment. We have seen an increase I'm especially proud of our first and second uh, year retention rates, and uh, it looks like we're showing some promise. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Vice Chair Rebsdorf. Uh, yes, in implementing those things and talking about them, how do you disseminate that and get it, make it effective throughout? Because obviously you can't do it all. You're exactly right. Yeah, so how do you You're do You're exactly that? right. And uh, I, you know, I will say we're still in process on all of okay. these things. So I mean, I can't say that we've how climbed that hill. How would you want but, to do that? Yeah, so, I mean, and some of what we've done as well. Um, one is we have to be very systematic and communication makes all the difference. So for example, with advising, um, we had what we, we brought on this uh, director of advising across the campus. Now, this gets kind of tricky because we have advising centers within the colleges, and I'm a real believer of colleges having great autonomy. In fact, I usually tell deans, you're the president of your own college and I'm here to help you. So I'm a real believer of that kind of decentralization for colleges. Um, but at the same time, we need some kind of integrative experience. So what we have done is we have formed an advising group that goes across the university so these people get together and talk about the issues that students are facing, that they are facing, and what they can do better. And bringing on this software, while not easy uh, from a lot of different perspectives, has helped because they're now all speaking the same language. Now, I'm gonna add one other thing here too. When we looked out there, we had some with a faculty advising model, some had a professional advising model, some had a peer advising model, and we had to say, especially in the provost's office, we're going to direct resources that go out there and hire advisors. I, to be very candid, I just put in a request for 25 new advisors for next fall. We'll see if we get them, but that's where the request is, we need more. Because what we have found, if you look at the research, professional advisors make a difference. They make a real difference. That is their life. And so we need to get more of that out there, get them the tools that they need to have that common experience, and then, then get them talking to one another uh, about what can be done for the students.
Dr. Allen from the College of Business. You usually have a question, so you got you're getting sure. picked on. I, I really <laughs> want to ask a question about the, your dancing ex, dancing with stars oh, experience gosh. up in Mayretta, Georgia. But I did uh, do Dancing with the Stars of Marietta <coughs> in about three inch heels, uh, but we're not going to talk. Well, you know, let's go on to something. Sixties <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Something different. Um, <laughs> the next president of FGCU uh, will join us after we've finalized a new strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, You'll have the, certainly the opportunity to shape and operationalize that plan. Um, so can you describe your experience with either leading the strategic planning process, implementing a plan, or using the strategic plan as a decision tool? Sure. Great question. Um, if I go back to my various administrative roles, department chair roles, dean roles, and now provost, uh, I've been either leading or a strategic planning effort, I guess, in uh, multiple departments uh, because we always had to have a, a strategic plan. In fact, it had to be in place for our accreditation, so it was something we had, which I'm sure you're well aware of, and, and so we had to have it there. So I led the strategic planning initiative at a number of universities uh, in the departments and at two colleges of business. And then coming into the provost role, I, I will just say I was part of a, a small leadership team that led now two strategic plans um, and implemented one of those plans. The second one is one that we're actually, uh, we were going through it last year, then we had a change of president, and then we were starting down another path, then we had another change of president. So it's, it's been kind of a, an iterative process, but we're still going through that, and I'm part of that leadership team. Um, and so, one thing, and I guess I should also say I've also been a consultant to nonprofits and corporations in strategic planning as well. Um, and so that's part of, part of my history. Um, the, what I've learned, though, is a strategic plan is not the strategic plan of one person. A strategic plan is a strategic plan of the, of the organization. So I know at some universities, there is oftentimes a concern, well, wait a minute, we have a new president coming in. Wouldn't they want to shape the strategic plan? To me, again, the strategic plan is the university strategic plan. You know, it should be dynamic. And so when I actually look at the strategic plan that you have, I actually see, I see one that's like, one is very good. I do like the four pillars in there. Um, Again, going back to maybe my first answer, and that is the, you're not trying to be everything to everyone. There's some great specificity in there. In fact, I have gone in as a strategic planning consultant sometimes and asked the first question of what are you not? What do you not do? And sometimes that helps you define yourself a little bit. And so when I look at this one, uh, I, see, I see great specificity. Um, I see a lot of room, though, to be flexible within there. And then one thing I think that's very important with strategic planning that I have learned from all these years is too often they are fluffy and get put in a drawer. And you could pick it up at many universities and you could just change the name of the university and they would look the same. Again, this one does not look that way, very sincerely. Uh, I'm a believer that strategic plans should have metrics in there things that we can measure. How well are we indeed doing? They should drive the discussion of budgets. They should describe the process of prioritization. And it should be a time, I can remember a time when we, in, in my department, we were talking about something as simple as when to schedule classes. And we went back and we said, in our strategic plan, we said that we are here to serve both part-time evening and daytime. Now this was another department years ago but we went back to the strategic plan it helped guide our thinking and our decision making and I think decision or strategic plans should do that at every level as well very good thank, thank you. you mr. Harrington uh, you had said uh, that you support our four pillars here at the university in your past experience uh, you created a degree program that addressed needs in high demand areas, including health sciences. 
You helped create an entrepreneur uh, center and a business <laughs> incubator. Uh, give me an example of, uh, of, of one of the programs that you saw was needed uh, and in a high demand area uh, okay. that you created there at Kennesaw. Okay. And again, I won't take personal credit because it's, it's all oh, of sure. us. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, there's one that, um, well, there, there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and give you two examples if I may. It's one I can think of that, that's really exciting and a little bit different was when we developed the, we started talking about a culinary program. Now this was not culinary arts, this is more culinary management. And we wanted to do something a little different. And we actually created something called the Culinary Sustainability Hospitality. And that is actually, and in fact, I remember the first time I wrote it out, I put a comma between culinary sustain and sustainability, and the director said, no, no, no. Remember, this is culinary sustainability. And this is also sustainability related to hospitality. And so we know that things like culinary and, and, and that arena are very exciting right now. And indeed, that program has gone within, I think, it's two or three years now, uh, from zero to... Uh, she's going to shoot me for not knowing the number. Uh, I'd say 250 to 300 majors. In that period of time, we've had a multi-million dollar naming gift to name that um, school now. And, it, and it, students are absolutely flocking to it. One that's even more recent, something we're doing right now, is cybersecurity, which is an interdisciplinary program. I was co-chair, I should say vice chair, not co-chair, vice chair of a task force in the state of Georgia to look at cybersecurity. And the demands to say are, are huge would be an understatement. And so um, I think if I remember the numbers, I think there are over 8,000 cybersecurity jobs in Georgia a year. And the whole system in Georgia was producing 49 graduates. And that's a pretty big gap. So we formed a cybersecurity institute that is a collaboration among numerous colleges. And that's actually being done right now. But Dr. Harmon, uh, just to follow up to that, sure. so Atlanta is a little bit different than Southwest Florida for a variety of reasons, obviously. Exactly. But one of the roles that the university plays in this region is the cultural hub. Yes. And you have a great business background, but as president, you would represent all of the different uh, disciplines. So how, how do you how do you view the arts, um, and and how would you envision a Harmon presidency? Um, taking the arts out and making sure that we grow the cultural hub of the region um, through the university and your presidency? Mm. Great question. Uh, I was just meeting with our arts dean yesterday who is a, a dear friend and we talk about this a lot um, because I see arts as one of the critical doors to the community. Um, in fact, it's one of those natural openings to the community that, that cannot be it cannot be over leveraged. I mean, you, there is just so much to be done there. And, and so uh, I think it's absolutely critical. And I think if you ever if wanted to talk to my arts dean, I think she would say that indeed uh, I am extremely supportive um, of their role. I mean, it's they're all, also the academic role, but also the cultural regional role. Uh, and I, we have dramatically increased our investment in the arts. Uh, we are currently investing even more into some studio spaces and things like that as well. Um, I think um, on a personal note, I also was a semi-professional uh, guitar player for most of my life. Uh, so I, have, I remember I was a guitar player for someone in Arizona. I also helped him with his taxes. So um, <laughs> it, you know, that kind of thing. But. You know, so there's at least an appreciation there and an understanding of what the arts can do. Uh, and so I think it, it's an absolute must for a university. And in fact, usually it's expected of a university. Wonderful. Um, I was going to ask a different question. Do you have any, to follow, are you a, a follow up? Question. Are you a follow up, Raleigh? Uh, Chair, or Vice Chair Rebstorf, <laughs> she's going to kind of follow up, evidently. <laughs> kind of, okay. okay. Uh, seeing that, uh, I notice you, you put emphasis on your honors college. Tell me what that's done for you. I'll tell you what I'm hoping it's going to do. Okay. Okay. Good, because we need to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> there was, this goes back about, um, gosh, 
I'm going to say three years ago. We had an honors program. And frankly, this was a conversation one day, the president and I were talking. He said, do you think we need an honors college? I said, yes, I think we need an honors college. And so we decided to have an honors college. Um, and we talked about why. I mean, it was more than that kind of a flippant conversation. And so we have an honors college. Uh, we've had interim leadership, wonderful, wonderful people in interim leadership roles. But just this past year, we went out and actually hired a permanent dean for the Honors College who had that kind of experience. And we, in fact, just met with her yesterday as well. And, and we're, we're still talking through what it means for us. Obviously, it's providing, as a, as a university gets larger, you have to provide that kind of experience that small college feel within a large university that an honors college brings to get the high performance students. Uh, I think that's just the automatic part of the honors college. I think though there's also other pieces to the honors college. As we start talking about recruiting of students, uh, we cannot go out into that marketplace of students and treat them all the same. There's a whole different, uh, there are different strata of students out there. And so when we look out there and we see high performing students, we need to have the Honors College part of that recruiting effort. And that is something that we are deliberately trying to do that. And I will say we are in the very, very early stages of that. Uh, now we've done a whole recruiting study. That's another uh, story. But part of that says you got to proactively reach out. Another piece that comes with that is I have gone to our trustees and our, and our trustees are foundation trustees. They are not governance trustees for the university. Um, but I went to our trustees at their retreat and we were talking about priorities and what I said would be a wonderful priority for us would be to have presidential scholars, true presidential scholars, that have a lot of money behind them and go out and get some of those students who could come in, be a vibrant part of the Honors College and have that kind of experience. Dean Gregerson. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, the need for garnering uh, external resources is, is becoming ever more important and yes. I'd like to learn more about uh, your experience there and the roles that you've played in, in getting external uh, funds for the university. Okay. Or universities. Uh, sure. Uh, if I go back to when I first became a department chair, that, again, as you know, my background is accounting. An accounting department chair, uh, part of their role almost always is fundraising. And it's going out to usually CPA firms. Also, there's other corporate entities and, uh, that can be part of this as well. So fundraising has been part of uh, my portfolio of responsibilities from the first day I became an administrator. So I have, if I go way back to in Arizona and Tennessee and different places where go out there and uh, find donors but you really it's it's more that development of relationships and uh, having them believe in what you're doing because what we find is people are very willing to give we just have to develop a compelling case for why here and so what you do is generate a sense of excitement let them be part of it as well um, and so that has always been part of my portfolio. I've uh, increased numbers of gifts, amount of gifts um, over those years. Coming into a dean's role, also a, a similar thing, but just at a larger scale. And um, <coughs> being in that role, uh, what I did, and I did some of this at the department level, but more so at the college level, is went to advisory boards and had very strong advisory boards. And a couple of times I've had advisory boards where fundraising was not part of what they did. And so I would meet with the chair of the advisory board and say, what do you think about this? And then have the chair go to the group and say, let's work on this. And so therefore they became what we call give or get boards. You know, give this much or get this much. There's just, just that expectation to be there. Uh, I've also been part of writing major proposals, uh, been part of de designing priorities for capital campaigns and developing case statements. Um, 
One thing I can tell you as a provost, when the, I'm, I'll go back to um, 2010. The president called me, and I remember the day I was on the golf course with a donor, by the way. And I was on the golf course, and my phone rang, and I saw it was the president. So I said, I'm going to sit this hole out. I'm going to talk to the president. And he said, uh, Ken, do you want to be provost? We just lost our provost. And I said, no. And he said, are you sure? I thought you might want to be provost. I said, sir, I, I'm enjoying being a dean, so I respectfully declined. And he was just really asking if I was going to apply. He wouldn't make it an appointment. He said, would you be willing to be the interim? And I said, sure. So I did. Happy to help. I said, as long as it's known that I won't be an applicant. This is coming around to your answer, by the way. And that is, I then, that year, did not apply. We ran a search. It didn't work. I'll just put it that way. The president came back to me and said, why don't you want to be a provost? And I said, because there are some things that a provost oftentimes does that, or doesn't do, that I love doing. And so I mentioned fundraising. I like being out there talking to people, generating the excitement and telling the story. Uh, it was also community relations. Because I'm one of those, I enjoy going, doing the Rotary and Kiwanis talks and just those kinds of things. And again, telling the story. It's all kind of that same uh, set uh, of examples, if you will, of the excitement of a place and who you're pitching it to. And so I really wanted to be part of those things. And so actually he said, as we got, he convinced me to apply. And he said, what if we change your portfolio of responsibilities to include those things as well? So I have had fundraising within that also. And, um, and so that has been part of my role. And again, I have uh, great relationships with major donors. And I could say one of them is actually now one of my best friends. Um, and it just started with those types of relationships. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Israel, did you have a question? Yes. I think you had an earlier follow-up, didn't you? Uh, no, this is actually a new question. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. Um, I'm no, sorry. Um, so FGCU's shared governance tradition brings together faculty, staff, and students we would like to know what shared governance means to you, yes. especially the role you feel a president should take um, in shared governance, and how you would assess the will of the different constituents. Um, in addition, if you could plus, uh, please address any role you've had in um, working with a unionized faculty. Okay. I'll go ahead and address the last one first. Quite honestly, I've been at a lot of places, but I've never dealt with a unionized faculty. Um, at the same time, I've dealt with uh, areas that, that had significant amounts of shared governance. Um, if I go back out to Arizona, they had a very strong shared governance system. And actually where I am now at Kennesaw State, we do as well. In fact, we've, we've enhanced it dramatically in the 10 years that I've been there. And I'll get more specific to some of your questions. Um, frankly, we talk oftentimes about shared governance in academic settings. Um, Honestly, it, goes to, it should go to any setting. In, in the corporate world, there's this notion of what we call uh, participation and acceptance. You accept things more if you're part of that decision making. And so it's just a, the right thing to do. And you make better decisions doing it. The thing is, you have to be very deliberate to hear all points. What we have done where I am is we have actually identified shared governance bodies. And when we came through this recent consolidation, we took another look at shared governance and actually expanded shared governance. And that is, we broke out, um, we have a, a staff senate. I, th I think here it's a, a SAC or something like that, if I recall. But, but a, a staff group, and we had, um, administrators group, we have student group, we have faculty group, we have a dean's group, we have a department chair's group, we have a number of different constituencies, constituencies and there are, when we're dealing with a policy, we actually have a group that ensures it goes through all of those different groups. And they provide input all along the way. And so I think you'll find that, that I'm a great believer um, in shared governance. Too often I've seen it just have lip service. It needs to be quite real. 
And I think if you were to ask Faculty Senate where I am, also the, our local chapter of AAUP, again, we're not unionized, but we do have AAUP. Uh, I'm actually a member um, and have been active with, with those folks and, and they uh, will come directly to me for, for issues quite frequently and we do reach out to them. Coming to, I think, the other part as far as a president's role here, I think a president, I, I've often said you accomplish what you schedule. And so you actually have to schedule time to sit down and listen to different groups. So there's just hearing different groups as far as issues going on, and then there's policy process. For a president, I think oftentimes you have to make sure you are hearing different groups so you actually have to have different groups, whether it's students, whether it's faculty, whether it's staff, and actually meet with those groups and, and hear them and talk to them. Thank you. So um, we're down to, we have about 10 more minutes to we're gonna turn over to you. So I wanna ask one question okay. uh, that relates back to uh, one of your first answers. So here at the university, we, we are very concerned about our, our, well, we talk about six year graduation rate, sure. which I don't like. I like to talk about four year graduation rate. Yeah, it's just the data they collect. So yeah. we gotta do well, that. I don't yeah. like that. <laughs> I agree. Um, with that said, um, it is a major concern, and you've talked about um, your, you've increased 12 basis points on your on your your graduation rates over time, um, and I know you've answered this partly, but I want more specifics. What what would you do? To, and we've hired advisors. A lot of the things you've talked about, we've done. We've implemented a software program for intervention, um, but I'm still sitting at the same number I was nine years ago, whatever that is. So I'm looking for someone to come in here and be dynamic in, in, in t tackling this problem because if we fix graduation rate, the other metrics that we're concerned about, time to degree, excess hours, cost of degree, those will come down. They exactly. will fall into line because that's what drives or it should drive those metric calculations. So can you give us a flavor for what you would do to tackle that problem day one? Great question. Thanks. Uh, and I have seen your data, and I saw that you had the increase and then back down and things like that. I mean, I've, I've taken a look at that. And, and to say that we, I think I made the point that we were doing very poorly, so we're sitting around the same number you are right now. So, um, so I, I know ex quite a bit about that position and then what it takes to go from there. And that is a, a bigger lift, I will admit, and don't take it lightly. Um, if you, I'm part of the group that meets in DC a time or two every year and talks about this very issue um, at, at a, uh, it's kind of a think tank up there. And I'm going to give you an answer that I can, I can give you specifics for what, depending on what we find, but frankly we, got it, we have to go in and use data. Data, data are critical. Uh, and historically we've had, and that's what we found. We were out there doing a whole bunch of different things. And just, gosh, if I go back just two weeks ago, somebody sat in my office and said, we're doing all these different things. Have we brought them together as a strategy? I said, we have not. So I said, we got to meet and come up with a strategy, pull it all together. But we have to have data. Because data will tell you the story. Because we can go out there and say, well, I go to an advisor and say, well, what do you think it is? Well, that advisor is going to tell you their view of the world, which may be very accurate for their world. So what we have to do is go out and get data and say, is it financial? Is it readiness? Readiness is also a huge issue. And so that may have to do with the nature of your admissions. Is it uh, difficulty in certain classes? And supplemental instruction, especially parallel supplemental instruction, has been shown to make a huge difference. So we have to go figure out what the problem is before we come up with the answer. We can sit here and talk about, there, I mean, there are a lot of possible answers. And these things work very well. But the worst thing you want to do is hit a target that's the wrong target. So I think the metrics are the, and the data analysis are quite crucial uh, to see what's actually happening there. And so, that would be my first thing, would be what data do you have? What does it say? What better data could we get? How quickly can we get it? And what systems do we put in place to analyze the data and take actions accordingly? Outstanding. Uh, I think Mr. Morton has a question and then I may come back. So, uh, Mr. Okay. Morton. 
you okay, yeah, and I do too. I, I have one too, but I want you to do yours first, then I'll come back to mine. All right. I think those of us with a healthcare medical background understand root cause analysis, which is yes. really what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Uh, what we haven't talked about is accountability. Mm -hmm. How do you hold the people who work with you accountable? And do you have any idea and impression about it? accountability as respects uh, the chair's question? We have a, lo a lot of the tools are in place, whether they're in the state university system yes. or not. What we lack at times is accountability. Uh, I will tell you what I am doing currently. And it's been a dialogue that we created starting about two years ago. And went to the deans, I now have, uh, at that time we had 13 deans, now have 14 deans. And, <clears throat> and got together and said, allocation of resources will be based on outcomes. And will be based on something other than rhetoric. Budgets oftentimes had been based on a person's ability to argue. And so what we have done is gone to the deans, and, and, and this has been a collective conversation. So again, it's that participation and acceptance notion. And so we've gone out to these deans and we've said, we're going to take, get some data and we're going to look at where you have bottlenecks, where there's maybe the underutilization of resources. And there's a lot of ways that that happens. And before you can ask for another dollar, we got to make sure you're using what you have the right way now. So it's been, a, it's been a real awakening to say that budgets are going to follow management and effective use of resources. So and, if, it was, if, if an institution is held accountable for a four-year graduation rate, should individual deans be held accountable for the four-year graduation rate? Yes. Now, I'm going to give them a chance, which is just a, a management philosophy of mine that I'm going to give you every chance under the sun, and it's a team effort, and we're going to go after this together. But I do it's think true. that we work together, and, and then we, we need to make it work. Uh, but I'm also not going to just point, if I'm not part of the team, I should be held accountable as well. And, and that leads me to my final question, and then we're going to turn it over to you. So if, if, if you think about risk profile for you, um, yeah. are you a risk-adverse person? You like a methodical uh, process, or are you uh, come in and change the world? And, you know, you're going to have your first presidency um, yes, if you were to get this job. And so are you, are you adverse to risk, and so you're a process person that's going to methodically do it? Or are you going to come in, are you the intermediate guy? You're going to assume some risk, and you're going to, you know you're going to upset the apple cart a bit, or are you going to turn the cart over and dump the apples on the road, run over them, and then say, there you go? <laughs> where, where, where do you fall? I'll stay away profile? from the extremes on that one. Um, <laughs> and, yes, I have three degrees in accounting, but most of my personality profiles show that I'm anything uh, other than an accounting personality. Um, I'm going to give you a measured response to that. Okay. And that is, I believe in taking bold steps. I believe in taking bold actions. I believe, though, in coming in and understanding the team, understanding a culture. In fact, I go back to you know, the Peter Drucker statement that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture makes a huge difference. So you got to go in and truly care about the people around you and really bring them along and give them an opportunity to blossom. So I'm not going to capriciously, and I would not capriciously throw people out. Uh, at the same time, we're going to get together as a team and we're going to get bold, make bold moves, and we're going to do it with a lot of excitement. And I think it would become apparent if somebody doesn't, is not part of that team over time, but it's really more of just a collective uh, sense of culture and doing something that's a lot of fun together and we get to watch those <coughs> metrics together. And so it is bold, but I do, you will find that probably number one priority for me is culture. And it's a culture of respect and caring about all of the people around you, make you making them feel like they're part of a team. Thank you. With that, I think we'll reverse the roles and okay. we will let you ask us questions I would just ask you to direct the questions to me, then I will yes, dis sir. disperse them across the uh, committee for answers based on what you ask. So with that, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the questions, by the way. This has been fun. Um, 
and this may have multiple parts to it, but I'm going to just ask it in the broad way first. And that is, if I were to go out here into the community and go to, let's say, an employer, or go to just somebody who has high school students and say, tell me about FGCU, what would they tell me? I think I will ask Mr. Winton first. He is a business leader in the community, so I think I'll let him respond to that. I may let a couple people, but I'll start with sure, him. Sure, please. I'd like to hear to different next, perspectives. Mr. Call, and then to you, Mr. Harrington, if you would. Good question. Yeah, <laughs> think about it. Um, for me personally, I would say that FGCU is a focal point of our community. And as a local business owner, uh, I've invested time and resources in a university because I believe in it. And education was the outlet for me. And I want other young people that look like me or don't look like me to have the same advantages that I've had because I got a great education. And so uh, I said in an earlier interview that uh, FGCU, because it's 20 years old only, has a lot of mothers and fathers that dote on it quite a bit. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Call, I'll, I'll ask you to uh, give an opinion to that. Okay. I will uh, I echo that as, as well as, again, it was said earlier that um, the, the founders are still around, and so there's a lot of pride in the, in the marketplace. Uh, so, so businesses... Um, and, and, uh, adults think very highly of it. I have two children that, uh, one just now entering, uh, college, I guess, sophomore in college and a, and a sophomore in high school. And so I get to see an array of children at our home, uh, a lot, uh, which is great, but we, but to get their perspective and hear it is, uh, is very similar. You, you oh, sometimes you wouldn't think that, but, but definitely the, the high school kids, do believe uh, that Florida Gulf Coast University is a very viable option for them to uh, attend this university. And it's a close university, so they can get – some of them will say that, too, that it's a little too close. I need to go get that. elsewhere. But they do think it's a very good university. So th that's my perspective. I've not heard anyone, no one, say it's not a good university. Uh, unless they're extremely close to it and they know some of the metrics that they want to see changed, you do hear that. But on the outskirts, uh, I wouldn't think, I don't think I've ever heard the metrics comments outside of this, uh, this room or the Board of Trustees or, or that type of thing that, that know them and know them very well. So I, I would tell you it's a very highly regarded university in the business community and in the uh, just the civil community. Mr. Harrington, would you like to add the Charlotte County view to this? Yes, I would. Thank you, uh, Chairman Smith. Uh, it's, it's, it's my belief from what I, I hear from you know, my people uh, up the coast here, about 40 minutes away in Charlotte County, uh, FGCU is, is our school of higher learning. Uh, we commute a lot of our students here, okay? Some do reside on campus. Uh, we we have we're filling a need that's been long needed, you know, for Charlotte County. I lived I've lived up there for 37 years, and uh, when the university came along, it was whew, you know, we finally got a school that's local and it's going to serve a good you know service well. Uh, we wish we did see more of the leadership up there. We don't see enough of them. Uh, we do serve an older age community, uh, older retire. I think we're the second oldest county in the nation. Charlotte County, and uh, they, the university does a good job, I think, of serving the needs of those folk who have retired from industry uh, and leadership where, and you know, all levels of ind industry, and uh, there's a cultural need up there, and the school has done a great job of serving that need, and the Renaissance Academy has done a great job. And Susan uh, came from the university, uh, well, came, came from uh, Charlotte County, and was very involved in our community up there before, and she's done a great job, and we're proud of her down here. And, and I would just add to that, you know, one of the, I guess, 
Um, one of the things that I've benefited greatly from getting to chair this committee and probably one of the more rewarding aspects is getting to interact with the community and hear the community and what they think about the university. And I would agree with what everybody said. It's been eye-opening to me how important FGCU is to everybody in this community. Um, when we think about community a lot of times, we do think about Lee and Collier counties, Naples and Fort Myers. Right. The reality is Charlotte County depends on this. We also have interior counties, Glades and Hendry County, and more um, increasingly Highlands County um, that we serve, and those kids uh, come here or adults come here for continuing education. And uh, it's been very gratifying for me. I, I told somebody earlier today it's unfortunate that um, everybody that's a trustee doesn't get to do something like this because it is an eye-opening experience for what this institution means to this economy, to the people of this community, and the students here. So I think you would hear nothing but praises. And I agree with you, Mr. Call. Um, sometimes people only hear us as trustees talk about metrics and our disappointment. Mm -hmm. But that the, 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 the sad thing is, is we don't talk about all the great things that go on in the community involvement. Our kids have contributed 1.2 million hours, or 2 million community hour, or community service hours. So we are ingrained in this um, community and we will continue to be, and that's what we're looking for the next president is to take sure. us to the next level. So do you have another, oh, excuse me, Vice Chair Rebsdorf. I just have to say there is one negative comment or we wouldn't be honest with ourselves. Please. And being in economic development, and I think Dudley can, our chair can chime in, we don't produce enough graduates. There, we have the CPA world, we have sometimes the engineering world uh, saying, I'll take care, it hurts, accounting world. They say, I'll take everyone you can produce, everyone you can produce. So we just can't produce them fast enough. So there's a good job market here. The graduates that mm. we do graduate get good jobs, but we need, we, we need to, that's the only negative comment I ever hear. We're an wow. economic engine. But. Excess demand is not usually a huge problem, but you know, I mean, I, but I get it. I mean, it's, it's a nice problem to have in some ways. But, but then yeah. when they hear the six year graduation rate, they say, what is your problem? That's the only time I hear it, David. Right. So. Right. Mr. Morton, you have a follow-up for a comment, please? Just, uh, we have uh, two of us are past chairs of the right. Collier County Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I think, like, without speaking for the other, uh, <laughs> FGC is viewed as the engine which drives the economy of uh, Southwest Florida. And we trust that we have visionary people continue to lead FGCU continue to lead FGCU because I think we've been the beneficiaries, three wonderful people who have laid the groundwork and yes. we stand on their shoulders, so to speak, but we're ready to take the next step. But FGCU is viewed uh, in the affirmative by everybody and I think we eat our own cooking, to put it in more uh, Dick and Jane terms. I know I, know I work <laughs> with a firm that uh, we have roughly 50 employees and 13 of them are graduates of FGCU. And we could pick and choose from all over the country right. what we do. And, and we choose to hire FGCU grads because of their preparation through the Lutgert School. Uh, and also something else, it's quite different, a, a sense of humility. I don't know if it's where, where we are, the nature of the school or the culture, but they don't have a sense of entitlement. Young men and women we fired um, want to work hard. Right. They produce, they've got the, the, the product of a wonderful education as well as a wonderful experience. And uh, they're, they're extraordinary young men and women. Thank That's you. Great answer. Can I do a quick follow up on that? Yeah, I was going to have yes, time. Yes, absolutely, you do. In what ways could Florida Gulf Coast be more connected? To the community. Anybody? Mr. Morton. <laughs> I'll give it a rip. Mm -hmm. uh, I think by, by tuning in to the needs of the local community and building on the strategic alliances and, and advantages that Southwest Florida has, we, as We've learned, we, we have an elderly population in parts of Southwest sure. Florida. 
We have very vibrant and young parts of Southwest Florida, yes. the emerging community of Immokalee, <laughs> yes. Arcadia, and others that are really growing and emerging as very young communities, both by age and by, by age of the uh, community itself, the structure. Of the by leveraging those strategic strengths, as an example, I'll just speak to healthcare. Enlightened self-interest is a very powerful motivator. And we heard earlier that I'm from here, by the way. I'm from Isla Mirada. And next time uh, you're there, buy your groceries at the Trading Post. That's a family store. There's some place, um, I, there's some place I go every in morning. In addition, but I don't if you know get the, the job helping lower tuition, okay. <laughs> exactly. buy groceries at the Trading Post. Um, there's a place I get chicken and biscuits. But healthcare is a powerful <laughs> motivator, and it's also an economic engine. Right. And uh, because people from Southwest Florida, most of them come from someplace else. I'm a graduate of Ohio State or Michigan or Wisconsin or whatever. Uh, and they have those loyalties that we sure. touched on. But enlightened self-interest, a powerful medical community and an engine that drives the future of medicine as an example, you want to be part of that. And you want to be part of that for a, a number of reasons. One, I'd like to be part of success. Two, if we have a powerful medical engine here in Southwest Florida, it's liable to help me live longer. It's going to have a value to me beyond just the immediacy of advancing FGCU. So how we leverage those strategic strengths, I think, is very important that, in identifying those within Southwest Florida. Great answer. Other questions, Dr. Harmon, you would have for us? Where are you on a capital campaign? Mr. Call, <laughs> the chairman of the foundation, he likes this. He likes and to talk. You guys about really, this. you guys really like this uh, <laughs> campaign stuff. Uh, so, so we uh, started a couple of years ago with a one hundred million dollar campaign. Right. Uh, we are above the ninety million dollar mark uh, and see no challenge at getting to. I hate to say it because anybody listening might say, "Well, then I'll hold off on giving." Uh, they should help us get way over the mark. Right. But we feel very comfortable that we are going to reach our $100 million. And uh, so, so that's the big capital campaign. Uh, for me, it's more about how are we using it and that type of thing. And I think we're, uh, we're doing a very good job of, of using that. Scholarships, also using it around campus in, in new buildings and uh, that type of thing. So um, feel very comfortable that on our 20th anniversary, we will hopefully reach our $100 million. And that's pretty big for us because, again, I explained earlier, we don't have an alumni base that, that other than uh, Mr. Morton over here. That's, that's older than 35, and he's just barely older than 35. So we, uh, but we, literally, you'd be 35 if you were one of our first graduates, sure. I believe. So, so uh, something of that nature anyway, 38 maybe. But, uh, yeah, so not a whole lot of, gifting from our alumni, but that doesn't mean we don't pay attention to the, the, that alumni, because someday they will be. Uh, so lots of different ways we go about that, but, but this is a very giving community uh, all the way up the coast from Marco Island all the way up to uh, our Sarasota uh, partners, and, and so it's been very, uh, very fun. You know, it's been a, a joy for me to be able to go out and I guess talk so. to these people. Frankly, that's impressive. Uh, for your size and your age, that, that's an impressive number. So congratulations. Very nice job. Dr. Harmon, back to you. Other questions? Where is your footprint in the international arena? It's a great question. Yes. Does anybody want to? Uh, Dean Gregerson. Yeah, I'll just say that that is a real opportunity for growth. Yes. I'll put it that way. <laughs> we, the we master did, of euphemism. Thank it, you. It, we, no, uh, we've dipped our toe. In, we do have a number of, of international programs okay. and agreements, and, and, uh, but I think we've just dipped our toe in the water. I understand. And, and uh, I think leadership in that area would be most welcome. Okay. It's, it's just a question I ask. I mean, I know you've done some things, and, yeah. and at your age, I wouldn't expect a whole lot, frankly. If but, I yeah. could add. Mr. Um, Martin. We have I have trust. What I'm about to say is totally accurate, but I believe we have the largest manufacturer in the world of micro uh, orthopedic instrumentation mm -hmm. in Arthrex, in our community. 
Right. They sell globally. They just opened a 250,000 square foot facility in Munich. that I've had the opportunity to see. They're all over the world. Uh, we have a lot of people who come, certainly where I'm from in Naples, we see a tremendous amount of foreign, generally visitors in terms of the hospitality trade. Southwest Florida is on the map. Now it's on the map for hospitality, maybe it's on the map for golf or whatever, but we have an enormous opportunity to leverage that and the international exposure in so many different ways. And, and I think it's a real strategic advantage of Southwest Florida right now. And it's also something that can change the lives of students fairly dramatically, is one yes. thing I've found. Got one more? Got one more. I got all week. Oh, we yeah. can be here all day. One, um, more, one more quick question, <laughs> if you will. How would you describe the culture internally at Florida Gulf Coast? T, I'm going to let you, as a student, I think, you know, I'm going to let you, you did really well with that earlier, so I, I think I'd let our student body president discuss that. Okay. Uh, I would say the overall campus culture is, is focused around two, two very interesting things, um, one being diversity and the other one being uh, environmental sustainability. Um, as a student body, we, we want our university to, to be and understand the uniqueness of our, our student population and be, be able to accommodate to those needs of the different student groups on campus. And at the same time, really own in on the environmental uh, sustainability efforts that one, we portray and, and, that we, and that we have encompassed in our academic portfolio. So it's, it's one of those things that we, as, as a, a large group of students, really proud themselves on coming to FGCU because of the environmental components of this university. So I, I would say that those two things, those two key things, uh, really describe our student culture. And you think things are going well in both of those areas? I think there's, there, could have, there could be some work done in each of those areas, respectively. Um, there's some things that need to be worked on, um, and it's having the right person to really focus in on that and not lose sight of that given the direction given by the Board of Governors and the Board of Trustees and really take that direction and infuse it with those key things is important. Great answer. I can see why you're the president of student body. Very good. We're glad you noticed that. He's a wonderful young man. Yes. Um, well, with that, I want to thank you uh, for your time today and your answers to the questions. And on behalf of the whole committee, thank you for coming down and having an interest and in spending some time sure. with us. Um, and just, you know, it's been really an interesting or fun time talking to you. And I just appreciate you being here today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let me, if I could, just yes, very quickly, uh, I've been on that side of the table many, many, many times. I know this has been a long day. I know you have an even longer day tomorrow. I know you don't get told thank you enough. So just on behalf of the academic community, thank you. Also, I've had a lot of fun today. So it's just been an honor being here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. Um, if everybody could just hang on for like two minutes, we'll get Dr. Harmon out. We got a few housekeeping things we need to take care of. We'll take two minutes. So if you guys would just give us two minutes, I'll be right back. Start the clock. <laughs>